Here's what you missed on Mike's mic. In November of 2021, I uploaded part one of my three-part probably unhinged recap of Pretty Little Liars series and I made a vision splash. After hundreds of hours of researching, 25 hours of footage, an army of colour printers, kilometres of yarn, a wide angle lens, and a crusty Alice and Dorantis wig, I did what not many others can. I ventured into the abyss and came out the other side. But soon enough, I felt the urge to venture deeper into the abyss. I held off for a while to give myself time to relax, get a tan, make some friends, maybe even get into a relationship, and I achieved absolutely none of those things. I've never felt more unhinged than I do right now, and it feels great hello everybody welcome to mike's mike my name is factually contractually and legally mike and welcome to my series discussing glee just a quick note please leave all compliments regarding my outfit in the comments below thank you now glee is the second show that i'm covering in this longer format the first of course being pretty little liars part one will cover seasons one to three and part two will cover seasons four to six because four to six come after one to three now there are some differences in how i'm structuring this series compared to the pretty little liars one so i'm going to explain the concept first in my opinion while the characters of pretty little liars are iconic as you can see the girls are on the wall behind me the main focus of that show is the Plot. That's why I structured that video in terms of plot lines between the characters so that you could see across the seasons how those relationships change. And because Pretty Little Liars is essentially a mystery, showing those plot points via lines on the characters I feel like was a good way of representing the information. Glee is a little bit different. I will not be discussing every single plot detail in Glee like I did with Pretty Little Liars because I don't think it will add anything to your experience and also the lack of continuity between plot lines would make you want to rip your face off. So for the visuals of this series I'm doing a greatest and worst hits for each character. I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I love high concept art and here is some high concept art. Literally like this room in my apartment it's a freaking pop culture museum at this point. I have not forgotten a single detail about Pretty Little Liars since that series ended and now I've added Glee. I've lost many social skills but I've gained the entirety of Glee. So here are all the characters for season one, the main characters in the big pictures and the smaller characters and I will add more across season two and three. A unique aspect of Glee that makes it stand out from its 2010 drama comedy contemporaries is that a lot of this show is essentially a musical. So inspired by that, the way we're going to be categorizing this information is by giving the characters CDs to commemorate these positives and negatives. Does anyone remember CDs? Retweet if you remember CDs. So for example, whenever Rachel Berry does something good, I will add a CD to her list. And whenever she does something bad, I will also add a CD, but you'll be able to tell the difference. A highlight I would consider to be anything positive, funny, or interesting that happens to the character throughout that season. You know what, why don't I just give you an example. So, in season one, episode three, Mercedes sings, bust your windows. I bust the windows at your car. And it's classic, like it's so good. So when I get to discussing that point of the show, I will add this, which is the Mercedes bust your windows entry to her discography. And we'll add it here. Who's doing this? High concept art. And in terms of negatives, like just... There's one big one right there. Here's an excellent cursed example, rapping. Mm-hmm, yeah. As you can see, the difference between the positives and the negatives. By the end of this video, every square centimeter of this board will be covered. And then my intention is that for part two, we will flip this $400 whiteboard over and we'll do season four to six because the main characters slightly change. So I thought that would be the best way of conveying that difference. Just a warning, this is going to be very biased. I'm essentially telling my version of the plot of Glee, Glee Mike's version. I do have some notes before we begin. This is your official warning that this show is absolutely feral. If something that I say doesn't make sense, it's probably because the plotline that I'm discussing makes absolutely no sense. Don't even worry about it. Two, this is your official warning that this show is absolutely iconic. I know a lot of people are just expecting me to unleash fury for two hours straight, but the thing is, this show was popular for a reason. It's really, really good. That being said, any harm done to you from your inevitable rewatch of this series caused by my YouTube videos is not my responsibility or my problem. Don't hit my line. Number three, leave me a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not already. <laughs> I bought a $400 whiteboard, $40 shipping. Like I'm invested. I need the AdSense. Girls, turn the ad blockers off. Turn the ad blockers off and refresh the page. Thank you. Also completely unrelated, but I should definitely have 1 million subscribers, an Oscar, a Grammy, a Streamy, 
and a knighthood by now. The fact that I don't is kind of strange and weird. What the hell, you guys? Number four, I will not be discussing the cast beyond the confines of the characters that they play on the show. As you all probably know, a lot of horrible stuff has happened. There's a lot of rumors flying around about interactions between the cast members, but I will not be discussing any of that. Nothing I say from this point is targeted at the cast. For example, me saying that I want to find a magic potion that makes me really tall just so I can step on Will Schuster and crush him, that has nothing to do with Matthew Morrison. If anything, the fact that I hate Will Schuster so much is a testament to his acting skill. So yes, we're here to have fun and that's what we're gonna do. Number five, I wanted to quickly mention that I'm not known for serious discourse. That is not my gig. There are people who absolutely 1000% do it better. If you want a well-researched and more serious look at Glee, which also covers the show's performance on the charts, I would recommend Here's What We Missed on Glee by Mike the Snare. Great video. There may, however, be a fight to the death because we both have Mike in our YouTube usernames. My lawyers will be in contact. Number six, I've curated a playlist on Spotify called the Mike's Mike Glee Experience. I've linked it in the description. It has a hundred songs from the first three seasons of Glee. And when I get around to adding part two, I will add more from seasons four, five, and six. The criteria for a song getting into the playlist, oh, it was very tough, very harsh. It was either important to the plot, one of my faves sang it, or it was a cover of a main pop girl. If you're listening to the playlist and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe he didn't put blah blah in there. Babe, there's over 700 songs covered on Glee. So I did a public service by weeding out the flops. And finally, number seven. Some iconic individuals reached out to me after my PLL series and asked how they can support me beyond like AdSense my videos. So I've linked my podcast Patreon in the description if you wanted to support me beyond the AdSense, which YouTube takes 45% of, but absolutely no pressure. Thank you. The IMDb synopsis for Glee is, a group of ambitious misfits try to escape the harsh realities of high school by joining a Glee club headed by a passionate Spanish teacher. Passionate Spanish teacher? You got a big storm coming. Anyway, in my opinion, I think Glee is at its best when it's a straight up comedy with the occasional song. Ryan Murphy is just a little bit of a comedic genius. The team behind the first three seasons, Ryan Murphy, Ian Brennan and Brad Falchuk are just so good at quick, witty, vicious comedy. They're also the team that made Scream Queens, which makes a lot of sense. And a lot of the reasons why I like Glee are the same reasons why I liked Scream Queens. But at the same time, the problems that I have with Scream Queens are also the problems that I have with Glee. Trying to balance this witty, vicious comedy with emotional plot arcs that go across seasons doesn't work fantastically and it becomes more of a problem as the show goes on. But I'll talk about that more as we go through. With all that in mind, one of my overall points to the first three seasons of Glee is if you don't get it, it's not for you and that's fine. In television, not everything has to be for everyone. But if you love pop culture, pop music and occasional Broadway tune, you will love Glee. Let's go through the characters that are on the board thus far. For context, my opinions on these characters are formed by the first 66 episodes of Glee. I haven't watched past that point in recent history anyway. And if I did before, I can't remember that shit. So anything that happens beyond that point, I have no knowledge of. Let's start with Miss Main character herself, Rachel Berry, who appears in 118 of the 122 episodes. Rachel is basically talented annoying bangs girl. She's a complex character and unfortunately she's kind of me vibes. I was thinking about this the other day and I was like wait I'm actually kind of Rachel Berry coded which also means I'm just annoying and I could rock bangs. I remember seeing a tweet or something of someone saying if you didn't hate every single character of Glee at some point you weren't paying attention. Rachel flips between being the absolute worst person and being a really good person basically from episode to episode but the main constant is how much she wants to be a star. I've picked three quotes that I think excellently illustrate this point. One from the pilot and two from season two, episode 18. During her New Directions audition, Rachel narrates, you might laugh because every time I sign my name, I put a gold star after it, but it's a metaphor and metaphors are important. My gold stars are a metaphor for me being a star. And she kind of slayed that quote if you think about it. I kind of want to put a gold star, you know what I mean? And then in season two, episode 18, there's a plot line where Rachel works out that half the Glee Club are pretending to sing while she sings because they're lazy and they know that she'll sing louder than all of them anyway. And Rachel's talking to Finn about how artists need to overcome obstacles. And she says, 
In my case, my obstacle is you, my lacklustre teammates who refuse to carry their own weight. That's so Rachel Berry vibes. And then the other quote from that episode is Rachel saying, I need applause to live. Tragically, that is so me vibes. But instead of applause, clap, clap, I'm talking about applause with a capital A. Applause by Lady Gaga, track 14 on Art Pop, the best pop album to ever exist. There's actually an applause cover in season five of Glee, but it doesn't involve Rachel, so it's out of sight, out of mind. Here's something that I came up with to describe Rachel. Wait, hang on. Why am I kind of giving Madonna album cover? <laughs> Rachel shows cat behaviors. Row, row. Ew. Competitive, ambitious, and talented. I just coined that term, so any royalties resulting from that inevitably appearing on a shirt should go to me. Rachel knows what she wants and she knows how she's going to get it. Rachel was raised by her dads, Hiram and Leroy, to be a star. And she says that they put her in dance and vocal lessons since she was two, so she would have a competitive edge. She's also smart and nerdy and really, really intense. Rachel Berry is also the best singer in Glee Club. I know a lot of you want me to hate Rachel, but I'm sorry at this point in time, I like Rachel Berry. And if that makes me the villain, then so be it. Finn Hudson is the quarterback of the McKinley High Titans. He joins Glee Club after some blackmailing drama, which we'll absolutely get into. And he has a hard time balancing being on the football team, trying to be a leader in Glee Club, trying to maintain romantic relationships and trying to remain popular all while having confidence and self-esteem issues. We find out that Finn's dad died when he was young and that it was tough for his mother Carol to be a single parent. Me personally, I don't really like Finn. It's not because he's the worst character on the show, I just don't think he's one of the more interesting characters on the show. In seasons two and three, I started to get a little bit annoyed at how he was always the go-to male voice in the Glee Club when there were other options. But also overall, I could see why people would like him. Will Schuster also goes by other titles such as Mr. Schuster or Menace, My Worst Enemy, Threat to the Earth. <laughs> I'm really, truly, absolutely, diabolically, clinically, literally, and scientifically, do not like Mr. Schuster. There are some things that he does and things that he doesn't do that just have me sitting there like, how are you still employed? I had to look him up on the fan wiki to find something nice to say about him because that is not something that I physically can do. Will Schuster can easily be described as the ultimate Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> on Mars, maybe. Sweet, compassionate, and even a bit naive, Will is always trying to do his best by not only his loved ones, but also his friends and students. He tries to see good in everyone and wants to bring that good out of others, especially if it turns out to be musical talent. He's often willing to overlook obvious personality flaws and can at times be completely oblivious to the manipulative and malicious behavior of other people. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Mr. Flopster has grand plans of restoring the Glee Club to what it was during his high school years, and we find out that Will won nationals when he was a member way back when in the 1820s. Here are some of his crimes. Being the absolute worst Spanish teacher ever. Blackmail. Being annoying and rapping. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. More on that later. Also attached to Will, we have his demanding and manipulative wife, Terry, and also guidance counselor, Emma Pillsbury, who's introduced as having severe OCD and also a severe crush on one Will Schuster for what and why. Sue Sylvester is the coach of the McKinley High Cheerios. She's absolutely feral and also an icon. She invented fashion and slang. Adidas owes all of their success to her. She also owns the color red. I had to pay Sue Sylvester royalties to wear this tracksuit here today. Also, I now understand the appeal of a power tracksuit. The jacket matching the pants gives an air of put togetherness. And then the sporty fabric means that I can run away and for slash or push someone at any time. It's like lawful criminal attire. Like Will, Sue is a menace, but the difference is she can sit at my table. I think Sue is probably in my top five characters. And as the show goes on, you start to learn more about her and you start to like her. And then the next scene will be her pushing over a kid in the hallway or pushing the coach of vocal adrenaline down the stairs. <laughs> As I mentioned before, one of the things that the writing team does so well are those quick, witty, vicious takedowns, and Sue gets so many of them. Well, I may buy a small diaper for your chin because it looks like a baby's ass. But yes, yeah, Sue is a four or five time national cheerleading champion coach. And on her to-do list next to being a champion is destroy the club. Around the second half of season one and through season two, there's this running joke that whenever Sue talks about ending the Glee Club, she says, destroy the Glee Club. In season two, episode eight, we see Sue's online dating profile, which lists the following things as 
things she's most passionate about, extreme taxidermy, tantric yelling, and poking the elderly with hidden pins. We also see that she's listed her age as 27. Next up, Kurt Hummel. Kurt is gay. Gay, 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 gay. He's an interesting character. He's introduced as this snobby and superficial outcast, but you can see that he's using those behaviors to shield himself from the rough hand that life has dealt him. At the start of season one, he's the only out gay person at William McKinley High School, and he's consistent bullied for it. Also, his mum died when he was young. He has a complicated relationship with his father, Bert. He's very lonely, but he can sing. Well, someone tell me, when is it my turn? Kurt singing Rose's turn is absolutely in the Mike's Mike Glee Experience playlist. Are you joking? Are you kidding me right now? Starting now, it's gonna be my turn. Obviously, there were gay characters on TV before Glee aired, but I think having Kurt as a main character in this show in 2009 was a big deal. Also, according to the Glee wiki, Chris Colfer originally auditioned for the role of Artie, but the producers loved his audition so much that they created Kurt just for him. He was used in place of an Indian character, Rajesh, who was intended to be Mercedes Jones' love interest. Now Miss Mercedes Jones, she's an icon. She's a legend. She's a visionary. Mercedes Jones. Mercedes is the first person to audition for New Directions. And she describes herself as a diva. She's got one of the best voices in the show, hands down. Sorry, was your hand up? Put it down. Hands down. Mercedes has a bit of a rivalry with Rachel, mainly fueled by Rachel consistently getting all the big solos. But at the end of the day, Mercedes is pretty much nice to everyone. Quinn for Bray or Lucy Quinn for Bray for my knowledgeable Gleeks out there. This girly right here, she's a fan favorite. She starts off as the most popular girl in school. She's dating quarterback Finn Hudson. She's captain of the Cheerios and she's also captain of the Celibacy Club. Quinn, Santana and Brittany initially join New Directions as Sue's minions and Quinn is quite antagonist vibe. We'll talk more about Santana and Brittany around season two. In season one, they don't get very many lines and they're also just kind of back up for Quinn and Sue's antics. Initially, we see that Quinn values how people see her above all else and it comes through in her obsession with trying to stay the it couple with Finn. Also, fun fact, apparently Diana Agron, who plays Quinn, broke her nose twice, which is why Quinn's voice is deeper in season two and three. Next, we have Noah Puckerman or Puck. Ah, uh, yes secondary male voice. Puck starts off as a member of the McKinley High Titans and he's just a straight up bully. Nasty, nasty girl. He's thrown many a slushy. He's been to juvie. He says that he's not book smart, but he is street smart. Also outside of school, Puck has a pool cleaning business that he uses to hook up with older women. Next up is Artie Abrams. Hmm. Hmm. Artie is one of the original members of New Directions and again, he's also a complicated character. He's ambitious and driven and hopeful, but also kind of sucks sometimes. Look, at the end of the day, sometimes I have beef with Artie. He's absolutely not the worst person in the show, but sometimes while watching, I was sitting there thinking, something about the way you're acting right now is not slay. Like you're not slaying, you're flopping. I do think that the fact he kind of sucks is a good thing. Just because he's in a wheelchair doesn't mean that he doesn't have personality flaws. Also, fun fact about Artie, he was in 100 consecutive episodes, something that these other girlies don't have on their resume. The last character that we're introducing at this point is Tina Cohen Chang. I like Tina, Tina stays under the radar. Everybody go stream Radar by Britney Spears, hit of the millennium, argue with the wall. Tina has a stutter, but we find out that she devised a fake stutter in elementary school so she didn't have to do an oral presentation. That's how much she wants to stay under the radar. Throughout the series, her personality changes a lot and apparently there's a big change between season three and season four. But again, it's beyond episode 66. I can't see it. Where is it? Someone tell me where it is. In my peripherals? No. I also like how Tina's fashion sense develops. She starts off serving emo slay and then she's serving goth and then she's serving 60s. She's versatile. Donatella Versace. Right then, season one, episode one, pilot. The pilot of Glee? Ooh. Oh, it's great. It all goes downhill from there. <laughs> I'm just joking. It actually all goes downhill after the Britney episode. I'm also joking. The Britney episode is so freaking iconic and I can't wait to talk about it. The very first scene of Glee is the Cheerios performing a difficult routine. And we can see Sue wearing her red Adidas tracksuit, holding a megaphone and saying, You think this is hard? Try being waterboarded. That's hard. Yeah, that's right. I had a megaphone this whole time and I saved it for this very moment because I have self-control. Just stay away and you'll be safe from me. Actually, we're not. What do you mean you're not? I get the feeling you don't know. What do I not know? Aaron Dale's in deep, 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 deep snow. 
You kind of set off an eternal winter everywhere. Everywhere? But that's okay, you can just unfreeze it. Where the fuck did that come from? Let's just go ahead and assign Sue some sleigh points. Here we go, ladies. Sue's first entry on the board. Tracksuit plus megaphone. Aaron Dale's in deep, 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 deep snow. Will Schuster, the Spanish teacher, arrives at William McKinley High School in his shitmobile, and he walks through the car park past Finn, Puck, and some other members of the Titans football team who are about to send Kurt dumpster diving. But not before Kurt takes off his designer jacket. Did someone say designer jacket? Did someone say fashion Met Gala vibes? Guys, I want to go to the Met Gala. It's, I know that's that easy. Like you just say you want to go and then Anna invites you. But I think she's got me blocked because I said that I wanted to go and she hasn't invited me. Anna, Anna, I know you're watching. Rachel is watching through the choir room door as the current Glee coach, Sandy Ryerson, rehearses a number with one of his students and Rachel sees him inappropriately touch the student on the stomach. In the staff room, we see Sue talking to Ken Tanaka and Will about how Principal Figgins has cut the staff coffee budget to pay for a nutritionist for the Cheerios. Guidance counselor Emma Pillsbury is also there and she is seen cleaning a table with gloves. She truly does not enjoy a germ. Ken has a crush on Emma, who has a crush on Will, who is married to Terry. Emma tells the squad that Sandy has been fired, and we find out later that it's from Rachel telling Figgins about what she saw through the choir room door. And Will, he's like, now hold on! Wait a second, a business opportunity. Who's going to coach the Glee Club now? Oh my god, someone needs to coach the Glee Club. Ooh, it'd be a shame if I did it. Villain origin story. Will goes to Principal Floppins, who says if Will wants to coach the Glee Club, he's going to have to pay $60 a month to keep it running. Right, it's time for the auditions for New Directions, which is what... Will has named the Glee Club. Mercedes is the first person to audition as she sings Respect by Aretha Franklin. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yeah, I know you just like got shocked at how good that was. Kurt sings Mr. Cellophane from Chicago. Mr. Cellophane. Tina sings I Kissed a Girl. I Kissed a Girl. And she does that as well. And Rachel sings On My Own from Les Mis. Or Les Mis. I don't know if you're a French enthusiast. And then she immediately gets slushied. Artie also auditions, but we don't see him sing anything. Look, I'm going to go ahead and put gold stars on Rachel's discography because it's just such a good little mantra to tell yourself. There we go, gold stars. Um, also, when I posted one of these on my Instagram story, someone said, why are you using One Direction font? One Direction does not own permanent markers. The Glee slushies, yeah, they're iconic. If I had to pick three things that Glee is known for, the first one would be the fast recaps at the start, followed by, and that's what you missed on, Glee, the voices doing the transition sounds, and of course the slushies. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that only the first two slushies were real, one on Rachel and one on Kurt, before they replaced them with some gelatin mixture that didn't hurt as much because the actual real ones were very painful. The first song that the five members of New Directions sing is Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat, which is not on streaming which is very offensive. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. There's actually a lot of callbacks to that performance throughout the series, so it's a cute thing to remember. Later on, Will runs into Creep Sandy at Sheets and Things, which is where Miss Terry works, and Sandy says he's now a drug dealer and gives Will a little sample of medical marijuana for free. And what does Will use that for? Oh. He later uses it for blackmail to get Finn to join New Directions. Yes, that is correct. Will hears Finn singing in the locker room showers and he's like, he's really good. So Will's way of getting this jock to join the nerdy glee club is to blackmail him and say that he found the marijuana in his locker and that possession is a felony and he'll let it slide if Finn joins the New Directions. Absolute menace behavior. Will Schuster, let me tell you something. This is a message directly for Will Schuster. That is all. The club goes to Carmel High to scope out Vocal Adrenaline, who they've heard is going to be very tough to beat at regionals. And we see Vocal Adrenaline sing Rehab, which is very much the first track on the Mike's Mike Glee Experience Companion playlist available at the link in the description. Now, Vocal Adrenaline is very good. New Directions are absolutely shitting themselves, and for good reason. Finn gets paintballed by the football team for joining Glee Club. Terry tells Will that she's pregnant, so now Will's like, by Glee Club, I'm resigning because I need to be an accountant to make money for my my child because my teacher's salary of two dollars per year is just simply not enough. And we also see Artie get put in a porta potty by the football team and Finn helps him get out. The end of the pilot is Will walking past the auditorium and he's in quit mode. Do, 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 do. And as he's walking past the auditorium, he hears the New Directions sing, don't stop 
Believe in If you didn't catch that, I'm referring to Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Will's like, damn, you guys really took your sleigh pills today because that was great. Plot twist, I don't want to quit anymore and I want to be with you guys when you win nationals. Now that little auditorium performance was also watched by Sue, Quinn, and Santana, dun dun dun, and also Puck. So that's the pilot. It is just such a good first episode. Ugh. It's Mike's Mike Approved. It's on the list of Mike's Mike Approved Glee episodes. I think it's such a good pilot because there are so many characters that they needed to introduce and they managed to give us a few personality traits of each character while also hinting at the possible future narratives between, you know, Will and Sue, New Directions at Regionals Against Vocal Adrenaline, Terry and Will having marriage problems, blah, 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 blah. In episode two, Sue tells Will to euthanize the Glee Club. And that's what you missed done, Glee. Now, during Sue's insult and her barbs, lol barbs, is this what I get for putting your bitches on? Is it my fault that all of your bitches gone? Should have sent a thank you note, you little hoe. Now I'ma wrap your coffin with a bow. Nikki, Nikki, she's just mad that you took the spot. Weren't that bitch mad that I took the spot? Well, if you ain't shitting, then get off the pot. During her insults, Sue also conveniently drops some contextual information. We love context. She says that New Directions have to place at regionals, otherwise Figgins is going to cut the Glee Club. And she also says that a team needs 12 members to be eligible to compete at section. Are you ready for a snack? Because here's some glee bread and butter for you all. The way the show choir competition works is you have sectionals, then you have regionals, and then you have nationals. Figgins has set the requirement for glee club staying alive at a placement at regionals. Remember that they saw Vocal Adrenaline performing and they're like, oh shit, they're really good. That's who they're going to be facing at regionals. Quinn is talking to Finn and she tells him to quit glee club because him expressing himself <laughs> is damaging their popularity. Quinn Bestie, that's a little bit of a red card. It's also like a recurring theme throughout the first probably two and a half seasons. So we're going to put a selfish track on Quinn. The main plot line for episode two is that Will needs to attract more members to qualify for sectionals. Remember the 12 person rule from before. And he wants them to sing La Freak at a school assembly to do so. And everyone's like, no. Boo, we hate disco. Can we do something modern? He's like, absolutely not. Because he's just out of touch and flop. Like, But then things take a turn for the diabolical. Absolute demon behavior. Will sings Gold Digger. With no bro, bro. What have I done in this life to deserve this? You know what I mean? Here we go, there's rapping. She ain't messing with no broke de broke. It's chilling. Like, I would say that rapping is one of Will's biggest downfalls as a person. And the worst part is he really thinks he's slaying. So I almost feel bad. Almost. Also, Will has been trying to save more money for the upcoming baby's debut. Remember Terry, pregnancy era. So he's taken a second job as janitor at the school after hours. Rachel joins the celibacy club to spend more time with Finn. Remember Quinn is dating Finn and Quinn is also a captain of the celibacy club. She is absolutely not boarding the Rachel Express. In fact, she dislikes the Rachel Express so much that she put giant rocks on the track so that the Rachel Express would derail. In Celibacy Club, we get that balloon scene, you know, where they're like humping the balloon. I'm not gonna do that visual light, like, come on now. Now, since the New Directions do not wanna perform Le Freak at the school assembly, Le Freak, the chic. Rachel calls an emergency meeting and they've decided that they're going to turn up the raunchiness and do a surprise performance of ass. Oh, that slayed a little bit. My sleigh radar went off a little bit. I felt like a little bit of a warning. The fire alarm, which also doubles as a sleigh alarm, started pinging. At the assembly, Will is like, what the fuck is going on in here on this day? And Sue goes to Figgins and demands that Will resign because of that performance, because he had endorsed that behavior. Rachel and Finn are practicing. They're singing in the auditorium. And next thing you know, Rachel set up a picnic. And next thing you know, they're kissing. Like, damn. Terry discovers that she's having a hysterical pregnancy and she decides not to tell Will because she realizes the only reason why he's staying in this marriage is because of the upcoming baby debut. Make sure you stream baby's debut song. Operation Fake Baby is a go. Quinn, Santana, and Brittany audition for New Directions with the song, I Say a Little Prayer. Now guys, this changed my life. I'm being so dead serious right now. If I could, I'd play the clip in here and I'll do a little dance for you. But because YouTube has the floppest copyright on the entire interweb, I can't do it. It's on my TikTok though. But let me do a little acapella moment here for you because I am a pop star first and foremost, so I can sing on the spot and I can also dance and I'm also an actor and I also deserve to go to the Met Gala. Every morning I wake up 
Before I put on my makeup, makeup, say a little prayer for you. But that performance is just so freaking good. Like, oh my god. Something shifted. The tectonic plates shifted. I know that. It was seismic. I love Quinn's voice. The fact that she only gets six solos across the entire series and five of them will be covered in part one. Diabolical. Santana and Britney are just backup vocals at this point. And also the backup vocals for that performance. It's literally like an entire church choir singing. And we're supposed to expect that it's just Santana and Britney. <laughs> But why is Quinn auditioning for New Directions, you might be wondering. She has a feeling that something's happening between Finn and Rachel and she's absolutely correct. So she's joining to keep an eye on that. When Sue finds out about their audition, she commissions the Unholy Trinity to spy for her so that she can destroy the Glee Club. In episode three, the New Directions decide that Mr. Schuster's choreography is just not good enough for them to defeat vocal adrenaline. So they decide that they need to hire this choreographer named Dakota Stanley. Now Dakota Stanley, mean horrible feral. Emma has sort of realized that Will is taken especially with the upcoming baby debut so she's kind of settled for Ken now. Will forms an acapella group with Ken, a guy called Howard from Sheets and Things and Henri St. Pierre who was a teacher that cut his thumbs off for being drowsy on cough medicine. Okay wow that's so relevant to me. If you listen to my podcast you would know that once upon a time in 2000 and 10 or 11 I dived into the pool at the school swimming carnival with my mouth open and like had a panic attack in the pool and I had to get pulled out the side of the pool by a teacher and which teacher pulled me out the one with four fingers on his hand what happened to the fifth finger he cut it off in the woodworking room boom ba, boom ba, boom ba, yeah boom, ba. anyway this whole Uckerfella storyline is all about Will getting his confidence back and he spends more time on furthering the Uckerfellas than New Directions there's a bit where Sandy tries to convince them to let him join and his main draw card for them getting him in is him saying that he can get Josh Groban to come to one of their performances and when someone says who is Josh Groban we get this who is Josh Groban kill your Yourself. Howard and Henri leave the group because of the pressure and guess who joins? Finn and Puck. It all culminates in them performing for Josh Groban but it turns out the only reason Josh Groban came to the performance is so that he could give Sandy a restraining order and thus the Uckerfellas break up. Mercedes develops a crush on Kurt and Quinn and Santana who are on evil mode convince Mercedes to go for it. Sue had said to Quinn and Santana and Brittany to play the members against each other to make them want to quit. Now Mr Dakota Stanley he's not cheap pretty penny required for his services so the New Directions decide to do a car wash during which Mercedes asks Kurt out and to deflect from telling her that he's gay he tells her that he's in love with Rachel Berry and because of this Mercedes throws a rock through Kurt's window and she sings Bust Your Windows by Jasmine Sullivan. This has to be in my top three of the season absolutely maybe even top two dare I say. They get the money required to hire Dakota but it turns out he's evil so they fire him. The next day Kurt explains to Mercedes what's been happening and he comes out as gay to her and the very next scene is Sue interrogating Quinn and Santana and she says let me get this straight. The show is so funny by. Episode 4 starts with Kurt performing single ladies in his basement with Miss Brittany and Miss Tina and when his dad catches him he says that he's just doing warm-ups for the football team which he is obviously on. Sue gets a segment called Sue's Corner on the local news which is the origin of and that's how Sue sees it. The C reminds me of the end mix choreo when it's like sorry if you don't understand that's on you though. Now even though the and that's how Sue sees it is iconic the shit that she spouts during Sue's corner ooh, it's like the worst of the worst of Sue. It's always so bad like mega yikes so I am contractually obliged to put that on her negatives and that's how Sue slays it. The New Directions are going to sing something from West Side Story and Will gives the solo to Tina and Rachel kicks up an absolute shitstorm about it because she wanted the solo and this is kind of a repeating pattern of behavior in which she demands every solo to ever exist under the sun so I'm going to put that on her board so here we go demands every solo. Kurt auditions for the role of kicker on the football team and he gets it the gig gets got and then Kurt scores the winning goal in his first game. Now are you ready for a bombshell from a blonde bombshell? Quinn reveals to Finn that she's pregnant. Finn's like WTF H-O-W and she says it's from the time that they were hooking up in the hot tub and then he got a little bit heated if you know what I mean and she says that's how she got pregnant even though they didn't have S-E-X and he's like hmm Okay, scientifically impossible that, that would result in pregnancy, but Finn is nowhere near intelligent, so he's like, OMG. We soon find out, however, that the father of Quinn's baby is actually dun dun dun. 
Park. And who finds out about the pregnancy and offers to take the baby off Quinn's hands once it's born? Miss Terry Schuster. Operation Fake Baby is kind of kicking goals right now. At the end of the episode, Kurt comes out to Bert and Bert's just like a little bit legendary about it. And we're also going to give Kurt a little bit of a little something something here. I'd rather be dry, but at least I'm alive. Rain on me. Around this point, we have three members of New Directions joining. So we have Mike Chang, Matt Rutherford, and also Noel Puckerman. Mike ends up becoming like a main character. Puck is a main character. Matt Rutherford gets like 0.25 of a line across the entire series. It's like, what did he ever do wrong to get that treatment? Episode five is called The Road's Not Taken, and it's all about Will's high school crush April Rhodes. Now Miss April Rhodes is played by Kristen Chenoweth and oh my god, can Kristen Chenoweth sing? My mum and sister were Wicked stands and we used to drive an hour to and from school each day and we'd listen to the Wicked soundtrack a lot. So I knew that shit back to front. So I know Kristen Chenoweth's voice. April went to Broadway and didn't quite make it and Will discovers that her life's taken a little bit of a tumble and now she has an alcohol problem. Since April technically never graduated, she can be part of New Directions and thus could be a secret weapon during sectionals and regionals. April's a bit of a bad influence on the New Directions, so she ends up leaving, but she's sorry for messing up, so it's like an amicable departure. Also, fun fact, when Will's talking to Emma about his old flame from his past referring to April, Emma mentions an old flame from her past named Andy. She mentions Andy and how weeks later Versace was dead. So it's a reference to Johnny Versace's assassination. And then like nine years later, Ryan Murphy, who created Glee, directed the premiere of the assassination of Johnny Versace, American Crime Story. Anyway, episode six has some intense mashups fueled by pseudoephedrine provided by Terry, who is fraudulently moonlighting as a school nurse to keep an eye on Will and Emma. Similar to how Quinn thinks something's happening between Finn and Rachel, Terry thinks something is happening between Will and Emma, and you know what? She might be onto something. Ken chaotically proposes to Emma, and Terry tells her that she should accept because Ken's available unlike Will. Now, Miss Emma, she accepts because she doesn't want to spend the rest of her life alone. I was going to say me vibes, but that's really not something that I should aspire to. Now, because of the drug drama with Terry fraudulently moonlighting as the nurse, Figgins fires Terry, and because Will let the drug use go unnoticed in the choir room, he appoints Sue as co-director of the Glee Club to keep an eye on things. Now, remember, Sue wants to what? Destroy the Glee Club. Also, here are some fun out-of-context quotes from the episode. You're not a nurse. You don't have any training. Oh, please, Will. It's a public school. And number two. It only comes back stronger, like some sexually ambiguous horror movie villain. Episodes 7 and 8 are disastrous for the Schusternators, but absolutely beautiful for the anti-Schuster agenda. Sue discovers from Quinn that the minority students in the Glee Club are feeling underappreciated because the solos and duets always go to Rachel and Finn and they go largely unnoticed. So Sue forms Sue's Kids, which is like a subsection of the New Directions, and she recruits Santana, Tina, Mike, Mercedes, Matt, Artie, and Kurt. She has them perform Hate On Me, which is one of my absolute favorite Mercedes songs. Oh my God, Mercedes just like, she slays every single song. It's actually ridiculous. Hate on me, hate us. Mr. Finn, he gets a yellow card for telling Quinn that he wants to name the baby Drizzle, inspired by rain or some shit. Like not Drizzle, come on. I think I'm gonna have to turn my down lights on and I fucking hate. Look at that shit. Fuck off with that. Now it looks like crime. Looks like I'm solving crime. When in actual fact, I'm just contributing to it. In episode seven, Quinn sings the second of her six solos, You Keep Me Hanging On. You keep me hanging on. Ooh, yeah, that was good. Side note, if there was ever a Glee reboot or a Glee boot, perhaps I would absolutely need Miss Quinn for Bray to sing The Man by Taylor Swift. In fact, I need a Taylor Swift episode in the Glee boot. Thank you very much. And the fact that there wasn't one in six seasons of Glee is borderline suspicious behavior. Anyway, the whole Sue's Kids debacle is resolved by Sue stepping down as co-director and Will says something criminal. You're all minorities, you're in Glee Club. No. No! Straight to jail, do not pass go. During episode 8 titled Mashup, Will tries to make a mashup of Emma and Ken's very different choices for a wedding song. We have the thong song and I could have danced all night long. We also have Will teaching Emma to dance 
and in that scene we get this. How do we describe these antics for the board? Will does horny dancing for Emma while she's wearing her wedding dress in the school after hours. It's actually so hard for me personally to talk about this. We're going to go ahead and put this entire episode on the board as one of his crimes, but just know that when you see this I'm referring to that screenshot. Finn and Puck, who famously were doing the slushying, have just been slushied by Dave Karofsky. Now, oh, I really do not like this man. He is the absolute worst and I'm absolutely not playing around with you right now. Like he's my enemy and he's gonna get so, 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 so much worse. Ken is getting suspicious of all the time that Emma and Will are spending together and he cracks it and makes the football players choose between football and glee club. Mike, Matt and Puck choose the glee club and Finn chooses the football team because he flopped. But then the ultimatum gets nullified by the end of the episode anyway, so it's inconsequential. The football team pressures Finn to slushy Kurt. Finn doesn't want to slushy Kurt, so then Kurt slushies himself to protect Finn from the wrath of the football team. Also, uh, Rachel and Puck are a thing. Puckleberry, they're a thing for a little bit in this episode. And I think it's because he realizes that Rachel is Jewish and his mum wants him to date a Jewish girl. So then they're Puckleberry for like one episode. The naming scheme is just so good. Puckleberry, come on now. That's probably the best one in the show. Boom. Quinn gets kicked off the Cheerios because of the pregnancy drama. The New Directions discover that Mr. Schuster has never been slushied. So then he lets them slushy him. And unfortunately, I have to give him a little something something for that. Ah! A 12 times slushy facial. In episode nine, the school refuses to pay for a handy capable bus for Artie to get to sectionals. So the New Directions try to raise money for one and Will gets them to spend three hours a day in wheelchairs to see what Artie's experience is. We then get this performance. Absolute chaos. Apparently a lot of the cast while rolling down these little ramps on the wheelchairs, they kept falling out and hitting their heads. Artie slayed the vocals for this, so he's gonna get a plus one for the episode. Here we go, season one, episode nine, wheels. Proud Mary, keep on burning. Sue holds tryouts for Quinn's position on the Cheerios and she gives it to the last person to try out Becky, who has Down syndrome. And during practice, Sue is harsh on Becky like she's harsh on everyone. And when Will confronts her about it, Sue says that Becky just wants to be treated like everyone else despite her disability. Now, Becky and Sue, yeah, they're an iconic duo. More on them later, but season one, episode nine is our first introduction to Becky. Tina tells Artie that she lied about having a stutter, so I'm gonna have to give her a yellow card for those antics. But when the universe taketh away, it also giveth, because I'm going to give Tina the award for emo fashion slay because on rewatch she's still demolishing the fashion game when everyone else is serving milk. I know you're sick of me talking about the lighting but I just would like to alert you to something. This room has three lights okay one at the back one at the back one directly above me. Why is this triangular? Why am I giving Illuminati on the ceiling? The follow-up to Versace on the floor. Illuminati on the ceiling? That's not even funny. I'm sorry. Kurt and Rachel have a diva off to see who gets to sing Defying Gravity. Why are we beeping outside? Am I not struggling enough as it is? Like, why are we beeping? They have a diva off to see who gets to sing Defying Gravity, but Kurt deliberately messes up the high note. It's a high F to be exact, because he doesn't want his dad, Bert, to have to deal with the inevitable harassment that would come from him singing a girl's song at a show choir competition. They end up getting the money for the bus, but Artie says that he wants to use the money to get ramps to make the auditorium accessible, but then Figgins tells Will that Sue already paid for the ramps to be installed. We find out that Sue has an older sister named Jean who has Down syndrome, Sue actually does a lot of nice things in this episode, which is why she gets the card there. And when I say a lot of nice things, I mean two, which is a lot more than the negative amount that she usually does. I would also say that season one, episode nine, Wheels is one of the show's highlights. So it is a Mike's Mike approved episode. Episode 10 is called Ballad and it's about rap songs. Just kidding, flopped. It's about ballads. The assignment is for the group to split into pairs assigned by picking names that Will has written and put into a hat. Artie pulls Quinn, blah, 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 blah. And Tina pulls out a card that says other Asian, referring to Mike Chang. Did Mr. Schuster write other Asian on this card or did Tina pick it up and look at it and say other Asian? Like that's her saying it. I think he fucking wrote it. If he wrote that, what the fuck is going on upstairs? Since Matt is out sick, which is why I even bother mentioning it, like you've kicked him out of the plot already. But since he's absent, there's an odd number, which means Rachel gets paired up with Mr. Schuster. Because she's spending so much time with him, she develops a massive crush on him. And Terry uses this crush to get Rachel to clean their apartment. Oh, okay, yeah. And look, while Will may not have done this himself, I'm still gonna put this episode as his list of sins because that combined with the weird name shit at the start, like, what? Quinn's parents find out about her teen pregnancy era because Finn sings You're Having My Baby to her 
while having dinner at the Fabre's. Boy, what? Now, Quinn's parents kick her out and she ends up moving in with Finn and his mother. Also, while all this is happening, Kurt is in love with Finn and is being mega flirty even though Finn is not reciprocating and it's starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. Episode 11 guest stars Eve as the coach of one of New Direction's rivals for sectionals, the Jane Addams Academy. Will thinks that Sue might be leaking the New Direction set list to their competitors, so he goes to the Jane Addams Academy and sees them perform Bootylicious, which is on the Mike's Mike Glee Experience companion playlist available at the link in the description. And he is blown away by the hairography that they use in their performance and he tries to incorporate it into New Direction's repertoire. Now, when asked what hairography is, Miss Brittany S. Pierce replies, You guys, it's like cool epilepsy. Kurt gives Rachel bad advice to change her image to be more provocative to impress Finn, even though Finn told Kurt that that's not the type of girl that he wants. So, Kurt? He's playing games, right? What's happening is that Kurt is jealous of Rachel because Rachel has a chance with Finn. So as a result, he's doing too much. After Rachel realizes this, they have a mini fight, but they end up being friends again, of course. Speaking of the end of the episode, Sue gives the New Direction set list to their competitors just as Will had suspected. You don't really need to know anything about episode 12 except for there's a fun mattress song situation and we also have Rachel saying that she joined every club that she could join just so that she could have as many pitches as possible in the yearbook. Rachel is going to get a point for scoring the mattress gig for the New Directions. Basically what happens is the yearbook photographer mentions that he's shooting a commercial for a mattress company and Rachel convinces him to hire them to sing jump while jumping all over the mattresses. It's a little bit genius at the the end of the day. Will finds out that Terry has been faking the pregnancy. Operation Fake Baby has been busted. She really is the queen of delusion for thinking that she would make it full term with the fake pregnancy. Queen of Delusion, the remix to Lana Del Rey's hit unreleased song Queen of Disaster. Now rather chaotically, Will gets disqualified from sectionals because he slept on one of the mattresses the New Directions were given as payment for the commercial, which means he accepted payment, but one of the show choir rules is that they can't compete if they're doing paid gigs because they wouldn't be considered amateur anymore. Did you get that? No? Okay, cool, let's move on. Now episode 13 sectionals this is a major highlight for the series this is definitely a Mike's Mike approved episode I heard you wanted the lighting to change again so I went and did that for you one of my favorite scenes of the entire season happens at the start of the episode and we have Mercedes Artie Kurt Tina Brittany and Santana all on the phone to each other and the screens like split so it has them all on the phone it's kind of like that scene in Mean Girls but the best bit is they're actually all at school and end up walking next to each other but are still on the phone it's high concept art and we understand what that looks like they're on the phone and they're talking about how they've discovered that Puck is actually the daddy of Quinn's baby not Finn and we get this iconic quote from Brittany she says sex is not dating if it were Santana and I would be dating and everyone's just kind of like what okay um anyway so since Mr. Bill Schuster right here is Bill like another name for Will because Wills are Williams and Bills aren't Williams but are Bills Williams I thought Bills are Williams let me ask the audience are you a Bill if so why? Remember, Will's out of action with the mattress drama, so Emma steps up as chaperone to take the squad to sectionals. But drama, it's her wedding day to Ken, and she's like, oh no, my wedding day is the same day as sectionals. Let me postpone my wedding by a few hours so I can take these little rats to sectionals. She truly is not invested in marrying Ken, and she's still in love with now freshly single Will Schuster, so she's doing all of this for him. When Brittany sees that Miss Pillsbury is the one that's taking them to sectionals, she says, she's the one they made me talk to when they found out I had a bird in my locker. Oh my God, I just remembered something. If any of you little shits in the comment section write that I look like Vector from Despicable Me in my tracksuit, I will block you so fucking fast. Mr. Finn Hudson finds out about the Puck Quinn baby situation. You are not the father. And he flips. He quits New Directions. It's, oh, it's all going down. It's sectionals day and the girls are losing it. At sectionals, they discover that the Jane Addams Academy and the Haverbrook School for the Deaf were given a copy of their set list by Sue and they're singing their songs. Disaster. Let's go ahead and deduct some points from Miss Sue Slavesta for doing the following menacing activities, leaking the set list. So Sue's leaked the set list, they're singing the songs, drama, drama, drama. Will convinces Finn that the team needs him, so Finn ends up driving to sectionals to rejoin them. New Directions have to come up with a new set list on the spot. And Rachel's like, babe, let me help you out. Let me sing a song that I've been singing since I was two years old. I know this song inside and out. Don't rain on my parade. Rain? On my parade? One thing about Miss Rachel Berry, do not tell her to sit and putter. Life's candy and the sun's a ball of butter. Now she really slayed that. I gotta have my bite, sir. 
The flavor's delicious. It's my pick for song of the season. Oh, life is juicy, juicy, and you say I've got to have my bite, sir. Finn arrives at sectionals and they sing, you can't always get what you want and somebody to love. Something that has consistently confused me across the seasons of Glee is how many performances per team at these competitions. In this episode, New Directions did three, Jane Addams Academy did two, and Haverbrook School for the Deaf did one. Initially, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna assume they all did three, but they obviously didn't show the other ones because these are just the important ones. But then that doesn't really check out because the three total songs that the other team sung were New Directions original three songs. So maybe they did just sing two and one. I don't know, okay? Anyway, New Directions win sectionals. <sighs> It's a big deal. And now they're on the road to regionals. Also, Ken breaks off the wedding. Figgin suspends Sue for leaking the set list. Post-competition, Will is once again reinstated as the coach of New Directions. And in the end, Will and Emma finally kiss. Overall, fantastic episode. In episode 14, there's a mini time jump. I think maybe a couple of months since sectionals. Sue drugs Principal Figgins and blackmails him with staged photos of them in bed so that she can be reinstated as Cheerios coach. That's criminal behavior. Like, I think that's genuinely crime. So here we go. Drugging plus blackmailing figgins. Finchel, which is Finn and Rachel, is now a thing. But it's rocky. During an off patch, Rachel meets Jesse St. James, who is the lead of Vocal Adrenaline, who's played by Jonathan Groff, who's Kristoff in Frozen, the first of two Frozen girlies introduced in this episode. Now, the New Directions, they're like, whoa, 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 dum 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 Stop fraternizing with the enemy, Rachel. He's just using you for regionals intel. So she's like, okay, guys, you're so right. I'm not going to see him anymore. But she's dating him in secret. Secret dating, oh my God, that's so Ezria vibes. Will and Emma are starting to date and he goes to spy on Vocal adrenaline and meets their coach Shelby Corcoran and he has a little makeout session with her. Now Miss Shelby, she's played by the iconic Idina Menzel, who is our second Frozen girlie of the episode. She voices Elsa. Amongst all his bullshit, Will realizes that he needs me time. So he and Emma put their relationship on ice for a while. Episode 15 is the first of the show's tribute episodes and this one is all about Madonna. I love the episodes dedicated to the girls, capital T, capital G. And after the frighteningly sudden flop aura of episode 14, this is a really fun Fun episode filled with good performances, so it's going in the Mike's Mike approved Glee episodes list. Let's start with some out of context quotes. Sue says to Will, Oh, hey, William, I thought I smelled cookies wafting from the ovens of the little elves who live in your hair. And Brittany says, When I pulled my hamstring, I went to a misogynist. So Will's like, Hmm, what should we do for this week's theme? And then we find out that Sue loves Madonna, and Will's like, Now hold on, let's do Madonna week. Sue continues her. Sue can. That's a skincare brand. Sue continues her blackmailing Figgins era by forcing him to blast Madonna songs through the intercom all day, except for Emma's office, because Sue has decided that Emma doesn't deserve the power of Madonna. <laughs> the girls of New Direction sing Express Yourself, express yourself as like a woo go ladies moment and all of the boys except for kurt are like boo this is so boring uh but at the end of the day who got the clicks views and engagement the girls and who fell off the chart the boys speaking of the boys flopping i think now is a good time to give Artie a yellow card he's dating tina but some of the things that he says to her and some of the things that he says to the girls in general are just not nice and i'm just like why am I smelling the stench of misogyny right now? So here we have some misogynist vibes on this card for Mr. Artie. He does apologize to Tina by the end of the episode, but he was being an ass, so it's going on the board. Will makes a passing comment about Sue's hair after she's consistently going after him, and she gets really upset. So Kurt and Mercedes work with Sue to give her a new makeover by doing a full recreation of the Vogue music video, like almost frame for frame. Absolutely fucking iconic. Oh my God, can you imagine not putting that on the board? Are you playing games with me right now? Also, just before the Vogue music video moment, Kurt says to Sue, Mercedes is black, I'm gay. We make culture. Go on. Jesse and Rachel are still secretly dating and he transfers to McKinley so that he can be with her without having to hide it. But everyone's suspicious because I think that he might still be a vocal adrenaline spy. Also, oh my God, when Jesse walks into the choir room, <laughs> Brittany says, Mr. Shu, is that your son? <laughs> because Jesse's now in New Directions, Kurt and Mercedes have realized that they have even less chance of securing solos if Rachel and Jesse are both in the club. So they join Sue's Cheerios. Sue has decided that she wants to add a performance element to her routine. Inspired by Madonna, of course. Bitch, I want to be a Cheerio so fucking bad. Now, episode 16 centers around a few key things. Kurt sets Bert up with Carol so that he can spend more time with Finn. He has ulterior motives. It is unfortunately another example of Kurt doing too much. I think doing too much is probably a good way of phrasing 
the negative aspects of his behaviors in season one. The award for doing too much goes to Kurt. Congratulations. Now Kurt's plan starts backfiring a little bit. Bert and Carol start getting close and then Bert and Finn have a good connection and they bond over sports. Kurt and Bert don't really bond over those types of things. Sue has an upcoming interview with a cheerleading magazine and tells new Cheerio Mercedes that she needs to lose 10 pounds before the interview. And this is in the space of like a week. So it sends Mercedes on like a spiral of extreme dieting and she starves herself to the point that she faints in the cafeteria after hallucinating that all her friends had turned into food. Quinn tells Mercedes not to let Sue send her down this dangerous path and she also tells Mercedes that she's beautiful. And we then have Mercedes singing Beautiful by Christina Aguilera in Grammy's fashion, I might add. Sue loses points for trying to shame Mercedes into losing weight. Boo! Quinn gets points for the pep talk about body image with Mercedes and Mercedes gets points for singing Beautiful. Also, Kurt kind of flopped as Mercedes' friend in this episode and it's because he's so focused on trying to get Finn, so I guess it can fall under that banner of doing too much. April Rhodes comes back and there's a Will and April plot, blah, 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 blah. But the result of her being in the episode is that her wealthy tycoon sugar daddy dies and she gets $2 million, buys the auditorium for the Glee Club and plans to go to Broadway to launch the first all-white production of The Oz. Okay. Girl, what the fuck? Episode 17 has Will rapping again. Ooh. He does need to be punished, but we've already cancelled him for rapping. So I decided, you know what, let's just extend the category and deduct points for him just straight up being annoying. Kurt leaks a video of Sue performing physical by Olivia Newton-John, and in retaliation, Sue tells Figgins about the Glist, a list going around ranking the members of the club in terms of hotness and popularity and sex appeal and all that jazz. The video goes viral and everyone makes fun of Sue, but then actual Olivia Newton-John gets in contact with Sue, and they film a collab version of the song, which makes Sue a top 700 recording artist. Sue then gives her profits from the song to her sister's care home, and there's also something about Olivia Newton-John screwing Sue over with the revenue split. Will discovers that the person who made the glist was Quinn, who's depressed about her free fall in popularity post Glee Club plus pregnancy era. I'm afraid to say Miss Quinn has been yellow carded for that. Here we have the deduction for the glist. Oh my God, there's also like this really feral and random performance of Run Joey Run. Rachel like triple cast Finn, Puck and Jesse as Joey. So it looks like they're all fighting over her and they all get mad at her and Jesse breaks up with her. I think I'm morally a obliged to give Rachel a negative one for the run Joey run debacle. One thing about Joey, he's gonna run. I've also got in my notes that Sue makes some offensive jokes in this episode, but it is absolutely not limited to this episode. Some of the shit that she says in season one is so out of line. Episode 18 and 19 are largely skippable except for four things. First of all, there's a moment when Mercedes and Santana are both crushing on Puck and they sing The Boy's Mine. The boy is mine, the boy is mine, the boy is mine, the boy is mine. But Mercedes works out that he's only interested in her because of her new social status as a Cheerio. So she drops him and also quits the Cheerios. Remember, she joined in the Madonna episode. Second thing, Kurt tries to change himself to appear straight and manly so that he can bond with Bert because he can see how easily Bert and Finn are connecting. And he sings my absolute favorite Kurt song, Rose's turn. I dreamed it for you, Dad. And if it wasn't for me, then where would you be? Miss Rachel Berry. Dun 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 dun. I'm a performer. I'm gonna perform. I'm sorry. Bert hears Kurt singing Rose's turn and they patch things up. Third thing, Will's high school nemesis, Brian Ryan, played by Neil Patrick Harris, turns up as a show choir conversion coach. What the fuck? And <laughs> and tries to crush everyone's dreams, but obviously it didn't work. The girls are still dreaming. And fourth, across episodes 19 and 20, Rachel discovers that her birth mother is the coach of vocal adrenaline, Miss Shelby Corcoran. That is such good casting. Like if you ask me in general what I would consider to be excellent family casting, I'll immediately say Rachel and Shelby from Glee and also pretty much the entire cast of Dark. We also find out that Shelby told Jesse to get close to Rachel so that he could guide her to make that realization about her birth mother. But Jesse says that a Along the way while doing those activities for Shelby, he did in fact start to develop feelings for Rachel. Jesse and Rachel are on again, off again. Remember he broke up with her post Run Joy Run. I think they're together again at this point. In episode 20, Figgins thinks that Tina is an actual real vampire because of her emo fashion slay. And he's scared of Twilight Fever taking over the school. Remember this is 2009. So he doesn't want her dressed like that anymore. And he says that she has to find a new style. Rachel storms into the choir room. And she says that she dug through Vocal Adrenaline's rubbish bins and discovered 18 empty boxes of Christmas lights and then went to the fabric store and discovered that they were sold out of red Chantilly lace, which can only mean one thing. 
they're doing Gaga. The fact that all it took was empty Christmas light boxes and red chantilly lights to know that they're doing Gaga, yeah. See, when you're a legend, like these things are just common knowledge. Now viewer, ponder this for me. An episode of TV from my favorite year for pop culture, 2009, all about my favorite pop star, Lady Gaga. Of fucking course, it's going in the Mike's Mike approved list of Glee episodes. Season one, episode 20, theatricality. Kurt and Tina turn up to school wearing Lady Gaga outfits. And Tina says she loves wearing champagne bubbles because even though I'm painfully shy and obsessed with death, I'm a really effervescent person. Karofsky and Azimio push Kurt and Tina into the lockers for dressing up. Did somebody say, Assault? Ooh, I hate this character so much. You want to get off my screen so bad? The girls plus Kurt perform bad romance in their Lady Gaga outfits and it's just, it's a legendary sleigh. Like, meanwhile, the boys are like, boo, Lady Gaga, boo, we can't sing Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga's for girls. First of all, shut the fuck up. It's time to deduct some points from Noah Puckerman. I haven't really talked about him that much so far because he's being a flop. So let's go ahead and put that on the board. Let's also put down that he told Quinn that he wanted to name the baby Jackie Daniels. But then after that, he gets serious and he sings the song Beth to Quinn as a way of saying, I think the name Beth is nice. No joke, if I had a friend named Beth, I would just call them Bethsy. Hey Bethsy. Things have been going great between Bert and Carol. So Bert invites Carol and Finn to move in with him and Kurt. Kurt goes a bit overboard designing their shared bedroom and Finn loses it and uses the F slur and I'm not talking about flop. Actually, Finn's quite spineless for most of this episode. Before all of this goes down, Kurt tells Finn about how Karofsky's been bullying him and asks if Finn can tell Karofsky to stop. But Finn basically tells him that he is the one that has to change and that he should try and blend in more because that's just how things are. Now, Bert hears Finn use the F slur and kicks him out. I'm gonna put this entire episode down as a negative for Finn, even though at the end of the episode, he finally stands up for Kurt against Karofsky while wearing a Lady Gaga costume and Finn and Kurt are friends again. But as Prophet Taylor Swift once said, you forgive, you forget, but you never let it go. Rachel tries to reconnect with Shelby, but they soon realize that they don't really work as mother and daughter. And Shelby says to Rachel, even though I'm your mother, I'm not your mom. Sweetie, I'm not your mom. And that they can just be grateful for one another for a while from afar. And then, oh, they sing this slowed down version of Poker Face and it's just so fucking excellent. Oh. Uh, oh, 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 I wanna roll with him, a hot pair we will be. I sound exactly like Elsa. Also, when they're about to sing, Rachel calls for the piano guy, Brad, that's this man here, and she tells Shelby how he's always just around. Episode 21, all you need to know is that Rachel and Jesse break up again, and he goes back to vocal adrenaline, and then vocal adrenaline throw eggs at Rachel. Will finalizes his divorce with Terry. Quinn sings her fourth of six solos for the entire series. She also moves in with Mercedes for a little bit. Um, also, Will's wife way of dealing with Sue's continuous bullying is to seduce her and then stand her up on a date to humiliate her. <laughs> what the fuck? Not on my watch. Absolutely not. Alrighty, season one finale. It's time for regionals. Let's go ahead and put it on the Mike's Mike approved list of Glee episodes because it's a classic. Sue tells Will that she's going to be on the panel of judges alongside Josh Groban and Olivia Newton-John and the new directions are like, well, it's over. Emma tells Will that she started dating her dentist, Carl, who's played by John Stamos. I'll put him on the board when we talk about season two. Now at regionals, Oral Intensity perform an Olivia Newton-John and Josh Groban medley, so they must have known about the judges. Hmm, it appears maybe there was a leak. New Directions get up on stage and sing a medley of Journey songs, including a fun mashup of Any Way You Want It and Lovin', Touchin', Squeezin', as well as bloody don't stop believing. Prepare your tomatoes, haters, because I have something controversial to say. I don't like don't stop believing. And you know what? Neither do the cast. There are so many interviews of them saying how much they hate it, so I feel justified. Now it's time for Vocal Adrenaline to perform and they're doing Bohemian Rhapsody, but uh-oh. Quinn is going into labor. There's scenes of Quinn yelling in the hospital while giving birth, cut in between clips of vocal adrenaline singing Bohemian Rhapsody and it's like all synced up. Like, I'm sorry, but you have to be a little bit of a genius to think of something like that. Mercedes, Puck and Quinn's mum are with her in the room when she's giving birth. And now it's time for the results. Oral intensity are runners up and vocal adrenaline win regionals. Which means New Directions did not place. And according to Figgins rule from the start of the season, if they don't place at regionals, the club is over. Now during judging, Olivia, Josh, 
Josh and random news guy that was also a judge that I didn't mention before. Oopsie. They're being horrible to Sue and we see that despite all the bullshit that she put the Glee Club through throughout the year, she actually voted for New Directions to win. So there we go. Sue voted for the New Directions. She then blackmails Figgins into giving the Glee Club another year because she can see how much value Will is adding through the program. At the end of the slay, Sue really does care for the students. And by giving the Glee Club another year, she can continue to torment Will. <laughs> also in the finale, Shelby adopts Quinn's baby Beth. Here are some observations after the season one finale. When do they do schoolwork? And a follow up question, what time of the day do they go to Glee Club? It seems like they're just always in the choir room. Honestly, less schoolwork happens in Glee than in Euphoria and I'm pretty sure Maddie Perez doesn't even own a pen. I also wrote in my notes that vocal adrenaline were actually very good and they deserve to win regionals. Some of the later competition wins feel like they're purely just to push the narrative and not because the winner was actually the best, but vocal adrenaline did deserve to win. Also, at the end of the day, Kurt and Mercedes got dust for dessert. This season truly was just the Rachel and Finn show in terms of solos and duets. Duh, 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 duh. Duh. One thing about me, I'm not scared to serve a visual. Yeah, these glasses, they're from Italy. 2011 Italian tour realness. Some of you understand, and those of you that don't, time to do some background reading. Why do I kind of look like a 40 year old pop star in 2012? Like the visual? Okay, season two. I think controversially, season two may be my favorite season and I'll say that and then I'll say the same thing about season three. It has a couple of my favorite episodes and also some of my favorite songs. The plot does start to stray a little bit, but overall I'd say it's pretty solid. There's also a shitload of songs, 131 to be exact, including some originals. Ooh. Season two takes place in the year after the year that occurred in season one. I can't remember how American schools do their thing. It's like junior sophomore senior is sophomore second then i guess this is that one in episode one britney says people thought i went on vacation but actually i spent the summer lost in the sewers i think it's time to properly introduce you to britney and santana miss britney i would say she gets the best one-liners like keeping the bird in the locker getting stuck in the sewers you know she just likes to have a little bit of fun you could say that sometimes it seems like britney lacks common sense but do not say that she's stupid because she's not. Miss Brittany is best friends plus a little bit extra with Santana and she's in both the Cheerios and the Glee Club. At some point in season one, Brittany said that it was her goal to sleep with everyone available in the school. Girlie's got things to see and people to do. Now Santana Lopez, she's one of my favorite characters on the show. She's quick with the insults and she can absolutely belt out a tune. She's not as stuck up as she seems and across season one to three, she becomes a better and better person, but she's still fiery and she will fight someone if necessary. In the summer after losing regionals, Finn and Rachel have been dating. Brittany got lost in the sewers and Santana got a boob job. So of course, Sue now calls her sandbags. Post-pregnancy, Quinn's back to being popular with her Cheerios uniform form slay. Artie and Tina broke up and Tina fell in love with Mike Chang. We have a new character, Coach Beast, who has taken over duties from Ken, who had a breakdown post-wedding floppification with Emma. Around season five or six, Coach Beast transitions, which is why I'm using this photo. This is post-transition. Also remember Matt Rutherford, who said like one line? Yeah, he transferred. So now New Directions needs more members and they're on recruiting mode. Rachel tries to recruit Sunshine Corazon, but Rachel's on feral mode. This is Sunshine right here. Rachel tells Sunshine that New Directions need people to stand behind her and stare at her with wet moved eyes while she sings solos. <laughs> and when Sunshine can't hear Rachel talking to her because she's got her earphones in, Rachel assumes that Sunshine can't speak English. So she says, Glee Club is fun. Swaying in background can be fun. Then they sing telephone in the bathroom and oh my God, it's just... It's so iconic. But Rachel is spooked that Sunshine might be a better singer than her. So instead of giving her the correct address for auditions, she sends her to a crack house. She later stipulates that it wasn't an active crack house. So calm down, everyone. Calm down. They can't hear me. They're listening to Kids Bop. Rachel Berry sent Sunshine to a crack house for auditions. That is nasty behavior. You're a very nasty girl. Now Sunshine ends up being recruited by Vocal Adrenaline, who offers her mum a condo and a green card. Everyone hates Rachel for a bit, as they should, and she feels bad for messing up, as she should. Finn recruits Sam Evans, who auditions by singing Billionaire by Bruno Mars. I wanna be a billionaire, so fucking bad. I actually don't though. Maybe like a cute little 10 to 15 million would be nice. Now Sam, he's a nice guy. He's kind of that hot sporty type, but also quite dorky. Like he's always reciting sci-fi references. So me vibes. I'm kind of Sam Evans coded if you think about it. Turns out Quinn is the one that told Sue that Santana got the boob job. And when Sue demotes Santana to the bottom of the pyramid for this, Santana and Quinn get into a massive fight and we get this gem. Oh, please. Stop she it. has a family, she's a mother. 
she's a mother. Now this is controversial, but I'm gonna give Santana points for fighting because it's just something that she's good at and I'm gonna reward her for that good for her. Oh my God, completely unrelated, but can you imagine if Glee did a K-pop episode? Stop. Imagine Quinn, Santana and Britney covering Stacey. Stacey girls, it's going down. Hey, episode two is so culturally important that it gives me chills and it makes me shiver and suddenly I have a sore throat and a cough. Oh no. It's a viral pop culture moment. Episode two is called Britney forward slash Britney, B-R-I-T-N-E-Y forward slash B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y. And it is one of my absolute favorite episodes of Glee. It is 100% Mike's Mike approved. Like I said during the Madonna episode, the episodes that feature the girls, capital T, capital G, are absolute chart toppers. We'll assign some flop theme for the week and New Directions are all like, boo, this is boring. Why can't we do something cool like Britney Spears? And then Britney's like, no, we can't do Britney Spears because my full name is Britney. Britney S. Pierce and I've lived in the shadow of Britney Spears my whole life. I'm sorry, that is just genius. Just the planning required, they would have had to have known that that was going to be her name from season one and they knew that this was going to happen in season two just for that payoff of one episode. Who wrote the episode? Ryan Murphy. Makes sense. Anyway, Emma Pillsbury's boyfriend Carl, remember I mentioned him at the end of season one? He's a dentist and he comes in to talk to the Glee Club about dental hygiene and gives them this blue tablet thing that shows plaque on their teeth and Britney's teeth are completely blue. Britney goes to Carl's dentist office to get her teeth cleaned and under anesthesia she she hallucinates that she's singing and dancing to I'm a Slave for You by Britney Spears. I'm telling you, cosmic event. Cosmic event. This was Britney's first big vocal performance on the show and Heather Morris is such a good dancer and the music video visuals were insane. Here we go, going on the board. Britney goes back to the dentist office with Santana and they both go under anesthesia at the same time and they have a joint hallucination that they're performing Me Against the Music by Britney Spears and Madonna. Get on the floor. And it's almost frame for frame like the actual Me Against the Music music video. To hell with stairs, my hips are moving at a rapid pace. And then at the end of the dream performance, guess who appears? Actual 100% real Britney Spears. Britney Spears talks to Britney S. Pierce. You're really hot. You're sweet. I just know the cast was screaming when Britney stepped foot on set. Just a quick note reiterating what we already know. Will Schuster sucks. Every time that Kurt says that he wants to do Britney, Will's like, boo, no, I don't like Britney. And when Miss Pillsbury says that Britney's iconic, he's like, yeah, whatever. Weirdo. That's sinful. Not liking Britney Spears is sinful. I'm dead serious right now. This is not a joke to me. We also have Rachel performing Baby One More Time and she unfortunately mega slays. And I'm saying unfortunately because minutes before she tells Finn that she doesn't want him to become popular again because she wants to be the only thing that makes him feel good. Rachel, girl, what the fuck? There's also a little thing where Finn was kicked off the football team and Sam was made the new quarterback, but then Finn comes back on. Boring. At the end of the episode, we have the New Directions performing Toxic for the Homecoming Assembly and the choreography is kind of raunchy. And we have Will sexually dancing with his students. Absolutely not. Enjoy prison, sir. So what's the message of this episode? It's so that Britney has a realization and she says, I'm more talented than all of you. I see that clearly now. It's Britney, bitch. My watch notes for episode three were verbatim. It got really serious and it's like, why aren't we singing fun songs and having fun right now? Basically, Bert has a heart attack and I think he's gonna die and a lot of the episode discusses religion. Bert's okay though, don't worry. Episode four, we have a Santana and Mercedes duet Mega Slay Supreme. The episode is called Duets and we have the club splitting into pairs in a competition to win dinner at Breadsticks. We get two iconic songs out of this episode, the first being Quinn and Sam performing Lucky, probably one of the best Quinn performances. And then we have Mercedes and Santana singing River Deep Mountain High. It's a classic, it's a classic. Sam and Quinn win the dinner voucher and yes, they did do a good job, but come on now, Santades should have won. Also around this point, Sam and Quinn start to have flirty vibes. Also initially, Kurt asked Sam to be his duet partner and Sam was like, yeah, sure. But then Flop Finn was like, no, don't do that. People make fun of you for singing with a guy. Can you not be annoying for five minutes? Also, Rachel's really nice to Kurt in this episode. She can see that he's lonely and she offers to sing with him and she says, I know you're lonely, but you're not alone, which is actually really nice. So she gets points for that. Oh my God, in episode five, Will makes the New Directions do the Rocky Horror Picture Show for the annual school musical, which is absolutely a questionable move. Finn is stressing out about having to take his shirt off in front of the whole school, which is totally understandable because why are they doing Rocky Horror? Also, Sam doesn't want to wear the golden short shorts that Rocky wears. So Will says he'll play the role of Rocky, even though there's a very touchy-feely number called Touch a Touch a Touch Me that he would be performing with students. Turns out Will is making the New Directions do the Rocky Horror Picture Show because he's trying to impress Emma and he found out that she likes Rocky Horror. 
by Manon's behavior. Like, is he serious with this shit? Episode six is a little bit of a collapse. The squad finds out that their competition for sectionals is an all boys school called Dalton Academy. Kurt goes to investigate and boom, we meet Blaine Anderson. Nah, why did I put Sam's lucky on Quinn's list? That's clown behavior. Blaine Anderson is played by Darren Chris, who also plays Andrew Cunanan in The Assassination of Johnny Versace, which is another link. You'll see in a lot of Ryan Murphy shows that he hires the same actors over and over again. For example, Lee Michelle was in Glee and also in Scream Queens. Dalton Academy is an all boys school and when Kurt arrives, it's portrayed as this like heavenly dreamscape where everyone is really respectful and bullying is pretty much non-existent. Hmm. Hmm. I went to an all boys school and let me just tell you, this could not be further from the truth. When Dalton Academy showed up, I laughed. I chuckled. I guffawed. It's just not true. Also, Dalton's Glee Club is called the Warblers and everyone in the school thinks that they're really cool and popular. Who lied? Anyway, Blaine is an underclassman and he's also the main vocalist in the Warblers and he's also openly gay. So when Kurt sees him, he's like, that's my man. Blaine's introduction song is Teenage Dream and apparently Darren Chris recorded this live and it's only one of like five songs that were recorded live. Kurt tells Blaine about his Karofsky bullying troubles and Blaine gives Kurt the courage to stand up for himself. So Kurt confronts Karofsky and Karofsky grabs Kurt and forcibly kisses him. Wow, we love the repressed sexual orientation to homophobic bully pipeline. Someone call Paige McCullers and Alison De Laurentiis. Also around this point, Puck steals his mum's Volvo and crashes it into a convenience store and steals an ATM. Okay, we love filler. Episode seven introduces another iconic new character, Miss Holly Holiday. She's a substitute teacher and the episode's called The Substitute and it's definitely on the Mike's Mike approved list of Glee episodes. Will gets sick and Holly Holiday comes in as the substitute Spanish teacher and she also takes over the Glee club while he's away. Less Will Schuster, you know what? Let's celebrate the small wins. Now, Miss Holly Holiday, she's like a cool teacher. Nothing says bienvenidos quite like a buttered floor. She's very relatable and she gets the kids. Holly comes into the Glee Club like, what song do you guys want to sing? Which they're not really used to because Will's always like, there's got to be another Journey song we haven't done yet. One of my favorite Glee songs is in this episode. We have Holly Holiday and the New Directions performing Forget You by CeeLo Green. Here are some fun out of context quotes for you. Sue tries to get Figgins to get rid of the football team and Coach Beast says, if you cut the football team, who are your Cheerios going to cheer for? And when Sue finds out that Will is sick, she says, why don't you go home, rest, watch some TV, die. <laughs> While this is all going on, we also have Sue appointed principal after Figgins gets sick and Sue is on a health rampage. She's determined to remove potato tots from the school cafeteria and Mercedes is just absolutely not having a bar of it because she loves tots. The fact that this is a real plot line is just so Glee vibes. Mercedes organizes a protest and shoves tots up Sue's tailpipe, which apparently causes $17,000 worth of damage and Mercedes says she's willing to go to jail over the tots because they have tots in jail. <laughs> I'm going to give Mercedes points for the Tots situation. Thus, therefore, you now understand the reference of this photo. Tots are 100% better than fries. I'll give you my limited edition Rina Sawayama hat and tax write of Sue Sylvester added as suit. When Will comes back to school, they sing Singing in the Rain with Holly and it's just like, Where did the water come from? Oh my god, we also have Karofsky telling Kurt that he will K-word him if he tells anyone about the kiss. Episode 8 has two weddings. Carol and Bert get married and after being a flop for most of the episode, Finn is actually really nice to Kurt at the wedding. So he gets a little something something for that, but also initially didn't want to confront Karofsky because it would jeopardize his position as quarterback. So he gets this little feat of graphic design that I made. The episode is called Furt, by the way. At Carol and Bert's wedding, Will Schuster sings, and that is just so evil in my opinion. Imagine Will Schuster performing at your wedding. I would walk out. Sorry. Sue gets on the dating scene and works out that the only person worth her time is herself. So the second wedding of the episode is Sue marrying herself in an Adidas tracksuit wedding dress. Yep, that's history. Karofsky continues to terrorize Kurt and Bert finds out about the threats that he made. So they go to Principal Sue and she ends up expelling Karofsky. Start spreading the news. I'm slaying today. But he ends up coming back because the school board says there were no witnesses to the D-word threat. Because of this, Sue resigns so that she can be eyes on the ground for Kurt. But Kurt ends up transferring to Dalton. I'm going to have to give Rachel a yellow card because when she finds out that Kurt's leaving, she's more focused on how Kurt leaving now makes him competition. Lol at this duality here, nice to Kurt. And then like a few episodes later, selfish about Kurt leaving. You can see from most of Rachel's negatives that the bad stuff she does comes from her desire to be a star. Like she's so hyper-focused on that, that she does some dodgy shit. Rachel in season two is much more unlikable, but 
also nicer. She's a lot more polarizing, if that makes sense. She jumps from badder bads to nicer nices. Because Kurt has now left New Directions, they need a 12th member for sectionals. Enter stage left, Lauren Zeises. We're introduced to Lauren after she rescues Puck after the football team locks him in a porta potty for 24 hours. Itsy for 24 hours. At sectionals, it's unsurprisingly a lot of drama. One thing about New Directions and performing, it's never gonna go smoothly. We have one of my favorite performances, Santana singing Valerie with Mike and Brittany dancing in the background. I would have put it on the wall, but I forgot to print it. Boo! Brittany was really nervous about performing, so Artie gives her his special comb, which is actually really nice. Also, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure at this point, Artie and Brittany might be dating. Dalton Academy sings Hey Soul Sister and Dun, 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 it's a draw. Which means both Dalton Academy and New Directions will be moving on to regionals. In terms of relationships at this point, as I said, we have Artie and Brittany together. We have Sam and Quinn together. Kurt is majorly crushing on Blaine. Puck is starting to crush on Lauren after she saved him. Finn breaks up with Rachel again. Tina's with Mike. Mercedes is single. And Emma marries her dentist boyfriend, Carl. Episode 10 is a Christmas episode, and I'm really sorry, everyone, but one thing about me is I do not do Christmas episodes. Christmas content on TV makes me so irrationally angry and I've pondered this at length and I can't work out why. It was the same thing with the Pretty Little Liars season five Christmas episode. Like I feel rage. Even though I'm ignoring this episode, I'll act out a fun exchange between Brittany and Artie for you. This is Brittany, that's Artie. What are you asking Santa for? I'm sorry? Artie, the roads to the North Pole are getting treacherous. You need to write your letter to Santa really fast and get it in the mail today. And remember, even the smallest envelope is heavy for an elf. Episode 11 is titled The Sue Sylvester Shuffle and aired after Super Bowl 45 and it's largely blah blah but we get an iconic performance of a mashup of thriller and heads will roll during a titans football game dance 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 till you're dead they're all dressed up like zombies which is fun and i love a zombie moment sue me i actually inherited that from my mum, who's seen every single piece of zombie media in existence there's also a lot of karovsky plot and i'm just like i don't care i don't want to see a redemption arc for this character sue makes quinn Brittany, and santana choose between the cheerios and the glee club and they choose glee club which means sue loses her star talent for the cheerleading regionals competition and the cheerios lose for the first time in like seven years and Sue is named loser of the year. Sue also tried to put Brittany in a cannon to shoot her out of it during the performance. Da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. No comment. Episode 12 is a Valentine's Day themed episode and it kind of continues the mid-season trend of just being a little bit filler. Of course you're going to run into this problem with shows that have 20 episode plus seasons but with Glee I find it a little bit more grating because a lot of these episodes have self-contained plots. Did we really need this episode if the issues that come up in the episode are resolved by the end of the episode and never spoken of again. Anyway, there's some shenanigans going on where Quinn and Finn kissed on the low, even though she's dating Sam. So when Finn sets up a kissing booth, Santana comes up with this evil mastermind plan to get Mono from a sick kid, give Mono to Finn so that Finn gives Quinn Mono when he kisses her. Santana says, and I quote, I've had Mono so many times it turned into stereo. And when she finds out that people think she's mean, she says, I just try to be really, really honest with people when I think that they suck. And I think I would like to live by that motto. Santana gets points for her evil plan. Also, Puck tries to impress Lauren by singing Fat Bottom Girls to her, which is obviously offensive. In episode 13, Sue calls Will Sponge Hair Square Chin, which is just such a smart and accurate read, so we have to formally acknowledge it. Like, he kind of does look like Sponge Hair Square Chin. We also have Sam doing really good Justin Bieber covers, and Mercedes saying, I gotta go get my trainers, wanna know why, I'm gonna be doing some runs. I'm also gonna give Sam a more general compliment. He's actually quite confident and sure of himself. What I mean by that is in direct contrast to Finn, he's happy to do Justin Bieber covers. He's happy to sing with Kurt, all that stuff. I feel like Oprah giving out compliments right now. You get a compliment and you get a compliment and you get a compliment. I'm giving a compliment to Brittany for the comeback outfits. It's for this outfit in particular where she's using Rachel's leg warmers on her arms. This is so 2022 fashion TikTok Bella Hadid Instagram meme page owner aesthetic. Phoebe Bridges, Grimes, Kesha Cannibal Core. It's actually relevant to the plot as well because Rachel hires Brittany to wear her clothes to make them popular, which would therefore make Rachel Rachel popular, but Brittany ends up being interviewed by Teen Vogue for her fashion when she's really just wearing Rachel's clothes. Also, unfortunately, we have to give Will something for helping Sue out of her post-loser-of-the-year depression. And we also find out that he sings to sick kids in the hospital. La 
like try as I might, I just can't spin that as a negative and I did try. Also Quinn tries to tell Sam that she didn't kiss Finn and that what actually happened is that she was choking and Finn saved her life by sucking the gumball out of her mouth. It doesn't work. So now Sam is with Santana and Quinn is with Finn. Episode 14 is called Blame It On The Alcohol and the best thing about the episode is when they sing Blame It On The Alcohol. But I will however be punishing Artie for rapping too much. He's hit the threshold of Schuster. Rachel has decided that the New Directions need to write their own songs to have an edge over their competition at regionals. She writes a song called My Headband and it's an instant classic, argue with the $400 whiteboard. My Headband. To get more inspiration for writing a song by creating more life experiences, Rachel throws a party when her dads are out of town and during Spin the Bottle, she kisses Blaine and falls in love with him for a little bit, which is fun. Now because the kiss with Rachel was so good, Blaine starts questioning his sexuality. And when he tells Kurt that he might be bisexual, Kurt, who's jealous of Blaine kissing Rachel, goes clown mode and tells Blaine that bisexuality isn't real. Kurt flopped, I'm afraid. Also when Blaine leaves the conversation with Kurt, he says, I'd say bye, but I wouldn't want to make you angry. Blaine and Rachel end up kissing again while sober and Blaine realizes that he is 100% gay. Miss Holly Holiday comes back in episode 15 as a sex ed teacher. The episode is largely forgettable except for Santana and Brittany singing Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. They go to Holly for advice on being confused about their relationship with each other and about their sexuality and she gets them to sing their feelings out to each other through Landslide. It's just so good. Santana tells Brittany that she's in love with her but she's not ready for everyone to judge them for being together. Remember Kurt only came out recently and things got so bad for him that he had to transfer her schools. Also, at this point, Brittany's dating Artie. It's honestly spin a wheel, get the first name. Spin the wheel again, get the second name. There you go, new couple. Episode 16 is a good episode and it's one of the highest rated episodes, but it's not on my list of favorite episodes because I have some issues with continuity around this point. With regionals coming up, everyone agrees with Rachel that they need to make original songs to give them an edge in the competition. This episode's also an important turning point for the series as a whole because up until this point, all the songs have been covers except for My Headband, which was an instant classic. In this episode, Kurt and Blaine kiss for the first time. It's a big deal for the Klein shippers. Mercedes writes a song called Hell to the No, which I'm obsessed with, but unfortunately it apparently lacks depth and emotion to use in competition, so it gets canned. Hell to the no. I mean, I would stream it. I would stream anything from Queen Miss Ladies, to be honest. And then suddenly it's regionals. Like regionals is randomly in the second half of episode 16 after taking up the entirety of the season one finale. So one of New Direction's rivals for regionals is Oral Intensity. And we find out that Sue pushed the coach of Oral Intensity down the stairs twice so that she could take the role of coach of Oral Intensity. It's of course all part of her plan to destroy the Glee Club. So Regionals is Oral Intensity coached by Sue, Dalton Academy and New Directions. New Directions win which means they're progressing on to Nationals in New York City. Timeline wise I'm confused because they literally just came up with the idea to make these new original songs and then suddenly there are Regionals performing these new original songs with full choreography. Sue says something like Regionals are this week and then they start writing so that means it all happened in the space of a week. Also, when it's announced that New Directions won and Oral Intensity lost, Sue runs up and punches the old lady announcing. And then it's never ever talked about again. Like that's a big deal. It fully took me by surprise. It's also very classic Glee to have something seemingly huge like that never ever spoken about ever again. Like if that happened in any other TV show, the characters would be talking about it for the next bloody 10 seasons. Also in terms of the original songs that they made for regionals, you know, they were cute bops. I would say the best one was Get It Right by Miss Rachel Berry. Episode 17 is absolutely ridiculous, like full on panned by critics. Everyone hated it, but it's so fucking funny and stupid that it's going on the Mike's Mike approved list of Glee episodes. There's this whole plot line about Britney being a genius at cat trivia. Artie's category for Jeopardy is white rappers. Sue makes a league of doom. Santana says, I have razor blades hidden in my hair. Next up, we have Rachel breaking her nose for a little bit in episode 18, and she wants to get a nose job based off Quinn's perfect nose. We then find out that the reason why Quinn is so obsessed with the idea of being prom queen and being the most popular girl in school is because she was badly bullied at her old school. Also, her name is actually Lucy Quinn Fabray. There's a funny moment when Kurt and Rachel are in a mall and he's trying to tell her that she doesn't need to get a nose job just like her idol Barbara Streisand didn't get one despite all the industry pressure. So he stages a Barbara Vention and Rachel's like, is she here? And Kurt's like, no, this is a mall in Ohio. <laughs> After I saw this, I was like, hmm, Barbara Streisand is mentioned so much in this show. I wonder if she's ever acknowledged it. So I looked it up and when she was asked, would you ever appear on Glee? She said, not if I can help it. 
<laughs> Santana sees Karofsky checking out Sam's butt in the hallway and in voiceover she says, I'm a closet lesbian and a judgmental bitch which means one thing, I have awesome gator. So she's discovered that Karofsky is gay and she's convinced him to be her beard but she's also got a second plan. Santana wants to be prom queen so her plan is to try and rehabilitate Karofsky, get Kurt back and McKinley so everyone can see how considerate she is and vote for her. Karofsky apologizes to Kurt for being basically the worst person in the Milky Way and probably in Alpha Centauri as well and Kurt comes back to McKinley. Get a job, stay away from her. Dating wise, I'm so confused because Santana is now beards with Karovsky, even though she's in love with Brittany, who's with Artie, but then Santana was also with Sam. Basically, the moral of the story is that everyone dates everyone at some point in this show, trying to keep track of it is ridiculous. In episode 19, we meet Brittany's cat, Lord Tubbington, an absolute icon. Here are a couple of things that Brittany tells us about Lord Tubbington. He's allowed to eat cheese because he's on Atkins and she's mad at him because she found out he started smoking again. We also find out that Sam's family have been having a hard time financially, so they've been living out of a motel. April comes back to try and convince Will to join her new musical, Crossroads, the April Road story after her all white production of The Wiz flopped. Artie calls Britney stupid and Britney's really upset because Artie was like the only person in the school who hadn't called her stupid and they break up. Santana sings Songbird for Britney and piano guy Brad is there and Britney says what about him and Santana says he's just furniture. Sometimes they try and explain why the band's there like oh they're practicing but then at some point they just kind of gave up trying to make it make sense so then they just start making jokes about it. Episode 20 is the 2011 prom and Karovsky is voted prom king and who is voted prom queen? Kurt, but not in a yas slay kind of way. More so in a, this school is full of evil little trolls that thought it would be funny to make fun of Kurt for being gay kind of way. And then the New Directions Sing Friday by Rebecca Black. As they should, record breaking smash hit, shout out to Rebecca Black. The pop cultural impact of Friday? Some people would be scared, and they are, as they should be. And then going from the high of episode 20, episode 21 is really, really sad. Sue's sister Jean dies of pneumonia. Glee is just an absolutely feral roller coaster of emotion. The New Directions plan and sing at Jean's funeral, and Will help Sue read her eulogy. The fact that I'm giving Will shoes to three positives in a row, he's really trying it. Also, relationship wise, there's a lot of flip flopping in this love triangle between. Rachel, Quinn, and Finn. Rachel keeps pursuing Finn even though he's with Quinn. Finn is telling Rachel that he can't be with her but he also doesn't want her to be with anyone else. Quinn slaps Rachel and then they're besties again. It's all just going on. After some drama about auditions for solos at Nationals, at the end of the episode, Will says that for Nationals, they're going to go back to what got them there, original songs sung by the entire club. Mm, that doesn't really make sense, doll. They sung two original songs at Regionals, one of which was the solo from Rachel and Rachel's performance was absolutely the best part of their performance. Also, why are they starting to write these original songs the week of Nationals? Will literally says, I want two hit songs before the wheels touch down at JFK. Hello? Like, oh my god. You'd bloody better hope so. Alrighty, it is time to talk about the season two finale titled New York. This episode has an iconic intro of Rachel Berry in Times Square and not to be lame, it gave me chills. It kind of feels like a culmination of all her hopes and dreams up until this point. One thing about Rachel Berry, she's gonna be a star. Like, Gurley is determined. So the New Directions are in New York, the wheels have touched down at JFK and they still haven't written those bloody original songs. So there's drama about that for a while. They also run around and sing I Love New York by Madonna and I swear to God, this show is going to make me a Madonna stan. Also, just putting this out there, I have to get to New York. Me personally, I have to go to the Met Gala. Mark my words, one day I will go to the Met Gala. I'm so Rachel Berry vibes like that. Also, like, how could you say no? I could turn up in this and everyone be like, whoa, what's he wearing? Yeah. You wish you could wear this, you can't. In a restaurant, Rachel runs into one of her idols, Patti Lapon, and it's just so me vibes. Like the time that I saw Troye Sivan getting off a bike, or the time that Billie Eilish liked my TikTok, or the time that Charlie XCX commented on my TikTok, like, sorry, not everyone understands. Kurt and Rachel have some cute New York moments, such as having breakfast at Tiffany's, and also sneaking onto a Broadway stage to sing a song from Wicked. Finn has broken up with Quinn since like episode 19, and there's this plot point that her life is going so terribly that she gets a haircut. What's that about? I've never experienced that. Don't look at this. At Nationals, Rachel sees Sunshine in the bathroom and gives her a pep talk, which is like a cute evolution since sending her to that crack house that one time. Basically, Sunshine's really stressed about going on stage and Rachel's like, you can do it. Now, after the New Directions performed their original song called Pretending, Finn is way too emotional and he kisses Rachel on stage at the end of the song and the audience is like, um, 
What the fuck? Finn flopped disastrously again, but this time was on the national stage. It was unprofessional and it definitely cost them. Their second original song called Light Up The World is cute, but overall it's not winner material. The New Directions place 12th. The top 10 teams move on to the final round, so it's over for the New Directions. The end of the finale is like a mini time jump to the end of the school year, and we find out that Sam and Mercedes have started secretly dating. Scandalous. Also in my notes, the last thing that I wrote for season two was I'm glad they lost. Oopsies. Duh, duh, duh. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I've added the final characters to the board. I've also added these, which are like blanks. They're supposed to be like blank CD, cutesy, Depop, $100, Y2K. The purpose of these is so that everything's aligned and perfect because if things aren't perfect, I will literally start screaming. I also added this little card for Santana. She's sometimes a little bit rude and it's true. Like sometimes in season two, she was a little bit rude. Season three, let's get cracking. Once again, the squad is having to face the dilemma of getting more members of New Directions after Lauren and Quinn have left the club and Sam has moved out of town. Sorry to miss Lauren. I didn't cover much about you in this recap, but the thing is, if there was things to cover, I would cover them. You didn't really make much of a lasting impact. Sorry. Now Miss Quinn, she's in an edgy new New era. In my notes, I described her new era as edgy skater, pink hair, computer science, cost Porter Pro, Arca, and Joya era. Everyone's like, Quinn, this isn't you. Quinn, no. But see, the thing is, she slayed. It looks like Sam Sadies is no longer a thing after that season two finale tease because Sam has moved out of town. So Mercedes is now dating a guy called Shane. And it also looks like Emma and Will are back together after she and Carl ended things at the end of season two. It's also senior year for a lot of the directioners, and this really confused me. For all of season one and two, I thought they were all the same age, but apparently not. The seniors in the group are Finn, Rachel, Puck, Quinn, Santana, Brittany, Mercedes, Kurt, and Mike. This is very confusing to me because there's a scene in season two, episode 19, where Artie goes into a home ec class to sing to Brittany and Tina and Mercedes are her classmates. Like how can Tina and Mercedes be Brittany's classmates if they're in different years? I don't understand how that school system works. Kurt and Rachel have decided that after graduating, they're both gonna go to NYADA, the New York Academy of Dramatic Arts, which isn't a real school, but but it sounds real. Like I would believe it. If someone came up to me and they're like, oh, I'm going to Nyada next year. I got early acceptance into Nyada. I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's so good. Congratulations. But the thing is, Nyada only accepts like 20 people a year. So it's going to be really hard for both of them to get in. Sue Sylvester has decided to run for Congress on a platform based on stop funding the arts. But uh, Sure, this is of course the latest iteration of her plan to destroy the Glee Club. New character alert, new character alert. Sugar Mota. Now, Miss Sugar, ooh, yeah, I'm a fan. Sugar wants to join New Directions and she's adamant that she's the best singer ever, but the thing is, the girlie cannot sing. She's so bad that Will breaks the one rule of Glee Club, which is allow everybody that auditions to get in. Will said, we're in nationals mode and we can't afford to accept anyone into the group that's less than super talented. Turns out Sugar's dad is mega rich and he ends up paying Shelby Corcoran to come to McKinley High to make a second glee club called the Trouble Tones that Sugar can join. I actually really like Sugar. I love her fashion sense and how ridiculous her character is. Like the way she introduces herself, she says, I have self-diagnosed Asperger's so I can pretty much say whatever I want. I'm like a diplomat's daughter. Blaine transfers to McKinley High. He Blainesfers. He says he did it to spend more time with Kurt and he joins the New Directions, which is a pretty big deal considering he was the singer at Dalton Academy. Like damn, they got a lot of star power now. Now remember that Shelby adopted Beth. With her being at McKinley High, she approaches Quinn and Puck and she says that she wants them to be a part of Beth's life as long as Quinn exits her unhinged era. Quinn promises that she will change, but it turns out she's actually plotting to frame Shelby as a bad mother so that Protective Services takes Beth and gives her back to Quinn. This is so intense. Takis are seriously intense. As part of Quinn's I'm Better Now charade, she goes back to blonde, changes her dress style and rejoins New Directions. Meanwhile, Puck's trying to be a good father figure for Beth, but then he ends up sleeping with Shelby? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Episode three is called Asian F and it's all about Mike Chang dealing with the expectation of his family that he will go to university to be a doctor while it's his dream to pursue dancing. It's a solid episode. Also, Principal Figgins still thinks that Tina is a vampire. Adi, Coach Beast and Miss Pillsbury are putting on a production of West Side Story. So we have everyone auditioning for that. When Mike's dad finds out that he's auditioning for West Side Story, he pretty much disowns him for a couple of episodes until Mike's mother discovers how talented he is and the situation gets resolved. Kurt wanted to be the male lead, but Blaine gets it and Kurt's like, oh shit, 
because he needed that for his Nyada application. Mercedes and Rachel auditioned for the role of Maria and they double cast it after a diva off. Mercedes says that she doesn't want it, she doesn't want to share the role and she storms off. Here are my thoughts on the matter. At this point in the show, I would say that Mercedes is a better singer, but Rachel is a better performer, so it would make sense that Rachel would end up with the role. Because of Rachel consistently being in the spotlight inside and outside of Glee Club, Mercedes decides to quit New Directions and joins Shelby's Trouble Tones. Will wants to meet Emma's parents and she's like, mm, no, you don't want to do that. But he sets it up anyway and it turns out that they're racist flops who didn't support their daughter through her struggles with severe OCD. In terms of Nyada applications, when Kurt realizes that he's not going to get the lead role in West Side Story, he goes fully into trying to win class president competing against Britney. But then during the Rachel Mercedes situation, when she thinks that she's going to lose the role to Mercedes, she decides to also run for class president for her Nyada application, even though Kurt absolutely needs it if he's going to have any chance of his application getting through. It's a complicated situation and I understand why she does it. She's desperate to follow her dreams, but it is a really mean thing to do to Kurt, especially because she initially does it behind his back. This one's for Rachel slaying the role of Maria in West Side Story, and this one's for the class president debacle. In episode four, we get a new character, Rory Flanagan. Now Rory's played by one of the winners of the Glee Project. The Glee Project is like a whole nother thing that I'm not gonna talk about in this particular video. I'll talk about it at the start of part two. Rory is an Irish exchange student and I don't mean to be rude, but he's very much filler character vibes. His plot lines are inconsequential. He does sing a few cute songs, but he's mainly just a number for the show choir competitions. Some more updates from around this time. Finn's being kind of nasty to Blaine because he's jealous of his singing and dancing ability. I do feel bad for Finn because he's struggling trying to work out what to do after graduating and then suddenly this guy turns up in New Directions who's a better singer and dancer but at the end of the day if Blaine is so good it's only going to help them in the competition. Mercedes convinces Santana and Brittany to join the Trouble Tones and they are already on explosive mega slay mode with only four members. They're so good. They sing Candyman and it's an event. I feel like the Trouble Tones are very much targeted content for me specifically because I love Mercedes, Brittany, Santana and Sugar and you know what while we're at it? I don't mind Shelby. Shelby's pretty great too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. As you can see, this is starting to fill up, which is exciting because we're getting close to the end of the video and I've inflamed tonsils from talking so much. So I'm very much excited for this to be over. Also from this episode on, Santana and Brittany are officially dating. Now to counter Sue's congressional pursuits to destroy the arts, Will convinces Bert to run against her and then he ends up winning a few episodes later. So now Bert is a congressman. This is for Sue running on an anti-arts campaign. Sue pivots her campaign to promise more funding for special education. So this is for that. And she says something that basically summarizes my feelings about the season two finale. She's talking about how McKinley High has special needs kids, but no special education class or teacher. And she says, I think that may be a better use of school funds than flying the Glee Club to New York without a set list, only to lose at nationals with the song they made up the night before. And she's absolutely correct. Now my notes for episode five are basically, why does Blaine dress like he's 50 years Years old. We meet a new leading man from Dalton Academy post Blaine's fur and his name is Sebastian Smythe. He's kind of like a male Santana in that he can really sing but also he can be quite nasty. You're a nasty nasty girl. Sebastian is making moves on Blaine and he doesn't see Kurt as a threat so he's really laying it on thick with the flirting. Artie is being really weird in this episode but honestly what is new about that? Yup you're going to jail. He's the director of the school's production of West Side Story and he implies that Blaine and Rachel lack passion on stage because they're virgins, which is inappropriate to say to start with. But then later in the episode, Artie, a student, interrogates Coach Beast, a teacher, about being a virgin, which is super inappropriate. Like you're talking to your teachers like that? It's getting weird. We find out that Coach Beast has a crush on Kuda Mankins, who's a college football talent scout, and they start dating. Kurt, Blaine, and Sebastian go to a gay bar and they run into Dave Kurovsky, who has changed schools and accepted himself, so he's no longer the world's most homophobic supervillain. Now, when they leave the bar, Kurt and Blaine have what I think is their first big fight and it happens because Blaine wants to be spontaneous and get a little steamy in the car and Kurt's just not ready for it. There's a plot line of Rachel wanting to sleep with Finn purely because she wants to be a better actress and when he finds out he's justifiably offended. Finn's just not really having a good time in general at the moment because Kuda Mankins told him that he's not good enough for college football. Also despite him being weird we do have to give Artie props for putting together West Side Story. The musical gets good reviews. In episode 6 Santana and Finn have some beef and after she keeps insulting him he outs her. You just don't do that 
that shit. And it's especially rough considering how hard of a time Santana was having coming to terms with her feelings for Britney and then this happens. Rachel withdraws from the class president election and encourages everyone to vote for Kurt. Remember he needs this for his Nyada application. When the votes are counted in episode 7, Kurt wins but then it seems someone rigged the vote so Kurt would win and we find out that that was Rachel. At the core of her actions, she was just trying to help him out and she felt bad about running in the first place. But it double backfires because not only does Britney end up being class president which means Kurt doesn't have anything to put on his Nyada application, but Rachel's punishment for rigging the votes is being suspended and therefore missing sectionals. So there's that situation summarized. Finn realizes how much of a little nasty he's being and he flips a switch and starts being really nice to Santana. It's a recurring part of his character that he'll mess up, realize that he messed up and then he's genuinely sorry for it. Kurt gets points for slaying a little bit in this jumper. Kurt's season three fashion in general is so much better than it was in seasons one and two. Also in episode eight, Sue says, why would someone assume I'm a friend of Ellen just because I'm mannish and highly aggressive and have short hair and I only wear tracksuits and I coach a girl's sport and I married myself. <laughs> Next we have Santana and the squad singing a very topical version of I Kissed a Girl. Also Santana comes out to her abuela who doesn't accept her and kicks her out, which is really sad. This is about when Bert wins that election against Sue. Also how's this for out of context information? We find out that one of Sue's booty calls is Vladimir Putin. In episode eight, the New Directions are absolutely fighting for their lives because they need 12 members to perform at sectionals and with Mercedes, Santana and Brittany defecting to the travel tones and Rachel suspended, they only have eight. Finn and Rachel drive to find Sam and convince him to come back to McKinley High. Turns out that he's been working as a stripper. And then the other people that they add to the roster are the drummer and guitarist that are always just randomly there in the choir room. Kurt and Sebastian are having more beef and Kurt says, I don't like you and I don't like your obnoxious CW hair, which is actually so wild because Grant Gustin, who plays Sebastian, ends up playing The Flash on CW's The Flash. So he genuinely does have CW hair. It was a prophetic read. I wrote down in my notes, why do they rehearse with the choir door open, spare a thought for the students? As much as I'd love to say that I would be like, yes, Glee Club, if I was a student at McKinley, that would absolutely not be the case. I just know I'll get pissed off at the absolute volume, the ruckus, the nonsense coming from that choir room seemingly all day. Also, the windows in that choir room are never open. I know it smells absolutely feral in there. Right, so it's sectionals time. We have the New Directions, the Trouble Tones who are using random Cheerios to make up their 12, and then we also have another team called the Unitards. New Directions wins, obviously. There's like 14 episodes left of the season. At sectionals, New Directions sang ABC, Control, and Man in the Mirror, and it was solid. And I like all of those songs, especially Control by Janet Jackson. I do, however, believe the Trouble Tones should have won. They performed a mashup of Survivor and I Will survive and it was a serve, argue with Alex Drake. I think Santana and Mercedes might be my favorite singing voices because they sound the least show choiry. Oh my God, also the fact that Mercedes and Santana were gone from the club, Rachel was suspended and Kurt still didn't get a solo performance at a competition. It's so bad for him right now. He needed that for his Nyada application, like I'm so deadly serious right now. Quinn organizes that the Trouble Tones girls can have one of the competition performance slots in New Directions if they come back, which they do. Nice negotiation skills, Quinn Steer. Shelby resigns post Puck hookup and sectionals lost. Tina does something really nice. She convinces Mike's dad to come see him perform at sectionals and he sees him dancing and he's like, whoa, you're really good. I want you to pursue dancing. With this seal of approval from his dad, Mike wants to apply to arts colleges, but the deadline has passed. But it turns out that Tina actually applied for him. Like Tina actually does a lot of nice stuff when she gets airtime the one second of airtime that she gets per season. Episode nine is a Christmas episode and we've previously established that that is absolutely none of my business. It's also randomly in black and white for a little bit, which is just so Pretty Little Liars season four, episode 18, Shadow Play vibes. In episode 10, Will proposes to Emma with a ridiculous swimming pool number and fine. He gets recognition for that because I love drama at scale and a swimming pool proposal is absolutely drama at scale. Fine, he slayed maybe just a little bit. But why did Artie have to wheel himself into the pool? Also, Will asks Finn to be his best man. So do you have friends? Sam wants to win Mercedes back from Shane and he decides he needs a varsity jacket to impress her and the only team with spots is a synchronized swimming team coached by Roz Washington played by Nene Leakes. Bitch, what? Where's Nene? Nah, where's Nini? I'm not playing around. Oh my God, I just got chills. I didn't print Nini. This is the worst day of my life. I knew something was missing. I knew there's no way that I'm not going to miss one character on here. And fucking Roz. I missed Roz. My flop behavior aside, Nini Leaks as Roz Washington on Glee is so iconic. Are you joking? It's getting weird. 
but I still got to get this watch. Roz Washington's claim to fame is that she won an individual synchronized bronze medal at Beijing. Individual synchronized. Good for her, I say. She's also a savage, like Sue Savage. The next plot point that we have is Becky wants a boyfriend, so she goes on a date with Artie, and when the Glee Club has a dig at him about it, he stands up for Becky, which is actually really nice. He also says a lot of really nice things about her. You slayed this one singular time, Artie. When Artie ends up rejecting Becky, she turns to Sue for support, and Sue's really nice too. Sue Sylvester, more like Sue Slavester. Also, Becky says that her second favorite movie is Toy Story 3, and this kind of threw me out because my mind can't compute that season three of Glee happened after Toy Story 3. Like those two things do not belong on the same timeline in my head. And then boom, jump scare. At the end of the episode, Finn proposes to Rachel. Who was scared? I was really, really scared, you guys. Almost no one thinks that it's a good idea. Episode 11 is a Michael Jackson themed episode and I collapsed. Let me demonstrate. When it happened, I did this. It sent me on a Michael Jackson streaming spiral. The songs are so good. I added five songs from this episode to the Mike's Mike Glee Experience companion playlist available at the link in the description. Some key elements from this episode. Sebastian throws an evil slushy with rock salt in it at Kurt, but Blaine jumps in front of it and he nearly goes blind and has to get surgery. Oh, we, oh, we, oh. Guys, what the fuck? I can't believe I forgot Roz Washington. Quinn gets into Yale and sings her fifth of six solos for the entire series. This is my absolute absolute favorite Quinn solo. I love that song, turn it up. Santana confronts Flop Sebastian about the evil slushy and she goes to Dalton to do it and they sing Smooth Criminal. And I'm sorry to say, it's a smash hit. It's a classic. Rachel and Kurt get letters from Niada which say that they're both finalists. Santana reveals that her vicious alter ego is named Snix. So obviously I'm obsessed with that. Snix is actually mentioned for the first time in episode seven, but whatever, what are you gonna do? Arrest me? Rachel accepts Finn's proposal. Nobody moved, nobody clicked. Nobody viewed. Nobody engaged. Well, oh, that was fucking funny. Oh my gosh. Should I do stand up? That just like, that was off the dome. Episode 12 is called The Spanish Teacher. And it's all about how Will is the worst Spanish teacher to ever exist in the history of ever. That man, he truly just sucks so much. Like you are a little bit the worst. An absolute diabolical menace if I ever saw one. Also Ricky Martin guest stars in this episode, which is fun. Both Will and Sue get anonymous complaints about their teaching. Will for using stereotypical and low key racist ways of teaching Spanish and Sue for just being Sue, I guess. Because of this, Figgins assigns Roz, I would point at the Roz picture, but I don't have one. He assigns Roz to help coach the Cheerios, which makes Sue absolutely feral. Also, Sue decides that she wants to have a baby. One of the jokes in Roz's repertoire is making fun of Sue being so old having a baby, and she keeps saying things such as, you're not gonna give birth to a child. You're gonna give... <laughs> You're not gonna give birth to a child, you're gonna give birth to a grandchild. There's this random whack storyline of Sue wanting Will to be the sperm donor for her baby. It turns out that the person who complained about Will's Spanish teaching skills was Santana and she goes off at him as she should. She says that he treats teaching Spanish like a joke by perpetuating stereotypes. In episode 13, we meet Rachel's dads, Hiram and Leroy. Yes, that's Jeff Goldblum. Both Rachel and Finn's parents are like, Oh, okay, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, okay, about the wedding. So they have all these little plans to make Finn and Rachel realize that they don't want to get married, but it doesn't really work, and they just end up being like, yes, let's get married quicker. New character alert, new character alert, Joe. He's basically like church guy with dreads. He's another Glee Project winner. He debuted with basically zero impact on me. He's no sugar. I love sugar. Sugar throws a Valentine's Day party at Breadsticks, and she says, I would like to thank my dad for making tonight possible, and P.S. he is not in the mafia. Also, Kurt has a secret admirer, and the whole episode he thinks that it's Blaine being cute, but it's actually Karofsky. Couples-wise, Mercedes and Sam were on again and off again, and then they were on again, and they were off again, and they were on, and they were off again, and Artie and Rory were competing for Sugar and Sugar chose Rory. In episode 14, the football team at Karofsky's new school finds out that he's gay and he tries to S word. And then like five minutes later, it's fucking regionals. The way that Glee goes from zero to 100 to zero to 90 to 30 to zero to 55 to zero in the space of like five minutes. Can we all just calm down? Karofsky recovers in hospital and he ends up going back to McKinley. At regionals, the Warblers sing Stand and Glad You Came and the New Directions sing a mashup of Fly and I Believe I Can Fly before the Trouble Tones take the stage and sing 
What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Stand a little top. That was not good. Apologies to Kelly. Now remember the deal that if the Trouble Tones come back to New Directions, they get to sing one of the competition slots. So that was that. I guess you could say that the Trouble Tones are kind of like a subunit in K-pop. Everything goes back to Luna. Um, you guys, is anyone else getting Odd Eye Circle vibes? Only bad bitches understand. Now, obviously the New Directions win regionals. Also, as if not enough has happened in this one episode, Rachel and Finn decide to have a court wedding. And when Rachel texts bridesmaid Quinn to hurry up, we see Quinn checking her phone while driving and getting into a car crash. Quinn's car crash, her quar quash. In episode 15, Quinn is in a wheelchair, but more importantly, Sugar has a really good outfit. Kurt also has a leather Gucci tie, and Roz tells Sue the doctor had to shine a flashlight in your JJ to get all the bats to fly out. Now, the first song that Quinn sings in wheelchair era, hmm, what could it be? Hmm. Of course, a performance of I'm Still Standing with Artie. Unbelievable. We also have a cameo from Matt Bomber as Blaine's TV commercial famous brother Cooper that everyone is obsessed with, including Sue, who zips down her tracksuit jacket in the school hallway so that he can sign her breast. <laughs> How did we get to this point? Also, Sue finds out that unless she wins another national cheerleading championship and the associated sponsor money, Roz, who is co-coach right now, will be taking over as Cheerios coach. Now, as we know, Sue is resourceful. She comes up with a plan to help New Directions win nationals so that she can use the money from that to ensure she stays Cheerios coach without Roz. Also, it's worth noting that Artie is very supportive of Quinn during her wheelchair era. Also worth noting that Sue has been really nice during her pregnancy era. Slay, 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 slay. In episode 16, Will says that he's out of lesson ideas and Sue says, let's be honest, William, you've been out of ideas since Madonna week. And she's right. We find out that the Nationals theme is vintage. So the New Directions have Disco Week inspired by Saturday Night Fever. Remember the New Directions are famously anti-disco. We also get introduced to a new character, Unique, who is the lead singer of Vocal Adrenaline. There's some drama about Unique wanting to perform at Vocal Adrenaline's regionals in drag. And Sue tells Kurt and Mercedes to make sure that it happens because she thinks that it'll be too much for the Ohio crowd, thus stopping Vocal Adrenaline from getting to nationals. Remember, Vocal Adrenaline won like eight years in a row, so they're the number one threat. And Sue wants New Directions to win so that she can go back to being Cheerios coach without Roz. Sue's plan backfires and everyone in the crowd loves Unique and Vocal Adrenaline. Mercedes is feeling a little bit lost about her plans post-graduation. So Sam secretly records Mercedes singing in the choir room and uploads it to YouTube and Mercedes goes viral. Also, when he shows Mercedes the video, it says that it has 485 views, but also 485 comments. So that means every single person that watched it left a comment. If you're watching this video, and you've made it this far and you haven't commented, that's embarrassing for you. So Sam Saides is back on. Also, Mercedes gets a career opportunity that comes out of Sam uploading this video, but we'll talk about it at the end of the season. We also find out that Jesse St. James is now the coach of Vocal Adrenaline. Also, Brittany gave Sue an idea to get Santana a scholarship for a cheerleading college, which she follows through on and Santana gets accepted. At the end of the sleigh, you know, Sue's sometimes for the people. Following on from episode 16's Saturday Night Fever theme, episode 17 is a Whitney Houston episode. Rachel and Santana do a duet. And afterwards, Rachel tells Santana that she's sad it's their last duet because they're going to graduate soon. Rachel gives Santana a picture of herself to put in her locker so that they can be friends for the remainder of the school year. And Santana puts it in her locker. You know, it's a little bit cutesy. We also have a plot line of Kurt flirty texting with a guy called Chandler from the music store and Blaine gets upset, but of course it gets resolved. Kurt, no. Remember how Will and Emma are engaged? When they're planning a wedding venue, Will says, at the reception, I will be rapping. Are you serious right now? Like, are you actually serious? Episode 18 is a fantastic episode. It's titled Choke and it's absolutely on the list of Mike's Mike approved Glee episodes. It's Nyada audition time. Guess who the admissions judge is? Carmen Thibodeau played by Whoopi Goldberg. Now Miss Thibodeau, she's notoriously harsh. They're so fucking stressed, like it's absolute disastrous scenes in the studio right now. Kurt was initially going to sing the music of the night from Phantom of the Opera and gets on stage in front of Carmen about to perform it but then decides at the last minute to change to not the boy next door from the boy from Oz. Miss Thibodeau says that he took a risk and he did a great job. Now Rachel gets on stage to sing a song that she knows back to front and a song that we've seen her sing a few times so we know that she knows how to sing it. Don't rain on my parade. She starts singing and she fucking chokes. She forgets the lyrics and messes up twice. You have stolen my heart. <laughs> Sorry. Carmen gives her one redo and when Rachel messes it up a second time, Carmen leaves. Rachel is in shambles. Now this is the scene of the historically important pleak. Pleak. <laughs> 
This is so disastrous for Rachel. She's been building to this moment for her entire life and she choked. I really like the writing decision to make Rachel choke in her Nyata audition. We're so used to seeing her being the best singer in all these ridiculous circumstances. Coach Beast turns up to school with a black eye and Santana makes a really bad joke about domestic violence. And when she says it, Sue and Roz hear her. Roz and Sue task the girls of the New Directions to sing songs about getting out of bad relationships, but they sing Cell Block Tango instead, which is about women K-wording their abusive boyfriends. They completely missed the point of the assignment, but that cover is so good. Santana and the girls apologize to Coach Beast, who ends up leaving Kuda Mankins in a couple of episodes time. Episode 19 is prom again. Did we not just have prom? Do you have prom every year or do you have two proms in one year? I'm pretty sure Brittany says there's another prom this year, but then Sam refers to prom last year. So this is simulation theory proof if I ever saw it. Quinn slayed her prom dress, but then we find out she's milking her wheelchair era to get sympathy votes for prom queen. But then she wins prom queen and decides to give it to someone who needs it, Rachel, who just had the flop of a lifetime. This is huge for Quinn because her desire to be prom queen has been one of her major drives since the start of the series. And then she got it and she gave it away. Did you get all of that? Also Finn is voted prom king, so it's Rachel and Finn, which is cute. There's this whole other plot about an anti-prom, but all you need to know is that Puck is really nice to Becky after he realizes how badly she wanted to be prom queen. And also completely out of context, Sue has infrared goggles. Yes, 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 yes. Episode 20 is kind of filler vibes, but it's also really fun and it focuses on Tina. So we're gonna talk about it. And it's also, on the Mike's Mike list of approved Glee episodes. Rachel calls Carmen Thibodeau about 500 times to try and convince her to come watch her perform at Nationals and see her win the MVP award. After Will talks about the National set list and once again it involves Finn and Rachel in starring roles, Tina cracks it. She's upset because she's an original member since the very beginning, since Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat, and she's been consistently overlooked. And she's absolutely correct in being angry because look at the board. She's only had four entries this entire time and it's not like I've deliberately left things out. I've like picked most of the Tina plot line. Tina says that all she wants is to feel like Rachel for once and get a standing ovation for a solo. And then she falls in a fountain and whacks her head and suddenly everyone in the New Directions has been swapped and she's now Rachel. Absolutely obsessed with the fact that we've spent 64 episodes building to Nationals and now we're having this cute little Freaky Friday moment. And then something disastrous happens to me personally. Will and Sue have been swapped and in a sick and twisted turn of events, I'm now giving Will Schuster vibes. This is so bad for me. My brand will never recover. Tina Rachel sings Because You Loved Me by Celine Dion and gets a standing ovation. Tina Rachel tells Rachel Tina that she's thankful for her being such a good support. She's basically saying all the things that she wishes Rachel would say to her in real life. And then Tina comes back to reality and gets out of the fountain. I wish this little sequence was longer, but also not this deep in the season and we got places to be. Tina tells Rachel that she should go talk to Carmen in person. She's helping Rachel because during Wife Swap, she realized how talented and driven Rachel is. ba da ba ba -da. They find Carmen and Tina says some really nice stuff about Rachel. We also finally get a Rachel and Tina duet. It only took 64 episodes. Totally unrelated and unnecessary commentary here, but at three minutes 30, we see a guy getting shit out of his locker and it's like a bottom locker. I had a bottom locker for most of high school, mostly because I was short, but bottom lockers are so embarrassing. It's like, why am I on the floor right now? Episode 21 is Nationals, bitch. Oh, it's a fucking classic. It's of course, absolutely 1 trillion percent on the Mike's Mike list of approved Glee episodes. Absolutely one of the best episodes in the entire series. Nationals is in Chicago this year. Mercedes gets food poisoning. Rachel runs into Jesse, who's coaching Vocal Adrenaline, remember? And she tells him that she's hoping Carmen Thibodeau will show up. The New Directions tell Mr. Schuster that they want to win for him because he's the teacher of a lifetime, which is cute. Right before they go on to perform, Mercedes makes a full recovery. And we also have Quinn, fully ready to dance now. Remember she was famously in Qua Quash era for seven episodes with her special guest star wheelchair. New Directions is up first at Nationals, the death slot. I'm watching and I'm nervous, like I'm about to get on stage. The judges for Nationals are some politician, redacted, and the queen of the universe, Lindsay Lohan. Also it's Lindsay guest starring as herself, and it's not one of the situations where the guest star plays someone else, like Gwyneth Paltrow. Lindsay smashes the Nationals judge role, by the way. New Directions perform Edge of Glory by Lady Gaga, Rachel does a solo of It's All Coming Back To Me Now, and Carmen Thibodeau turns up halfway through. They wrap up their set with Paradise By The Dashboard Light. Vocal Adrenaline, featuring Unique, performs Starships by Nicki Minaj, which honestly is a weird choice for a show choir competition. They should have done only. In the judging room, Lindsay Lohan says that she liked New Directions because she favors a team on the brink of a major comeback. Meanwhile, Jesse runs into Carmen and tells her that Rachel is the most talented person he's ever met, which was a really nice thing to say. It's award time. Unique is voted MVP. Vocal Adrenaline comes second and New Directions win Nationals. Ah. 
They finally won nationals, bitch. Three years in the making. They go back to McKinley and they're serving show choir champion micro celebrities and the school's like, yes, we love Glee Club. We never said anything bad about Glee Club. Rachel signs her first autograph and tell me why I nearly cried at that. For what? Sue gets her Cheerios back. At the end of the episode, Principal Figgins announces that the 2012 Teacher of the Year is Will Schuster. Good for you, Mr. Shu. Ew, I can't believe I sang that. I have a couple of continuity questions from this episode. What happened to Sunshine? Where's my bestie? I'm not playing around. Also, last year at Nationals, there was that whole thing where New Directions came 12th when they needed top 10 to go through to the next round, and then this year there's absolutely no noise, no mention of a top 10 or mention of another round of singing. Do they just not do that anymore? It's possible that there was a rule change and I just wasn't paying attention. The season three finale titled Goodbye is another fantastic episode. As you can tell, almost all of season three's best episodes are towards the end of the season. And this episode had me fucked up. I shed a tear, it's true. I cry like maybe twice a year and this episode got tears out of me. It's all about the seniors graduating. So we have all these goodbye type songs. So for example, we have Will singing Forever Young and the episode starts with the original Glee Club members singing the first song they sang in the pilot, Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat. Cool, guess I'll have a meltdown then. Bert gives Kurt his graduation gift, which is him performing single ladies in the auditorium with Brittany and Tina like Kurt did in season one, episode four. Cool, 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 cool. I'm doing fine. No emotions, I'm emotionless. In my Glee characters ranking video that I did millennia ago, I ranked Bert way too low and you guys ferociously canceled me for that. And you are Absolutely right in doing so. Because of the video that Sam took of her singing, Mercedes gets a recording contract as a backup singer. Mike got into a ballet academy in Chicago. Brittany has a GPA of 0.0, .0 so she has to repeat senior year, which is iconic. Or you, person who's watching this and not doing their work. This is a glimpse into your future. Will tells Finn about how he planted the pot which he used to blackmail him into joining the Glee Club. Remember that bullshit? The planted pot? The pot plant, of course. Quinn gives Rachel a Metro North pass so that she can go to New Haven to meet her at Yale and Quinn says that she has one so she can visit Rachel in New York. That's the bit I cried at. All the shit that goes down, I'm like, oh my God, a free train pass. Sue and Quinn say goodbye to each other. And after all of the bullshit that Sue has put Quinn through, she says, I admire you, Quinn, for Bray. Like, damn, the tears are kind of on tap right now. Puck has been stressing about passing a geography test he needs to graduate. Blah, blah, blah. He ends up passing. Then the Nyada admittance letters arrive. Rachel and Kurt open them with Finn, who's applied for the actor's studio. Finn opens his. He didn't get in. Kurt opens his Nyada letter. He didn't get in. Rachel opens her Nyada letter. She did get in. Let Kurt into Nyada. I'm so deadly serious right now. This is not a joke to me. Rachel says that she'll defer her acceptance so that Kurt and Finn can apply again the next year and they can all go together at the same time, which is a really fucking nice thing to do. Like, sorry, I wouldn't do that. Santana, Puck, Mercedes, Quinn, Kurt, Finn, Rachel, and Mike graduate. Finn picks up Rachel to go to their wedding. Yeah, remember how they got engaged and they were gonna get married and then Quinn got into a choir quash and the wedding didn't end up happening. Well, it's happening now, just kidding. Instead of going to get ready for the wedding, Finn drives Rachel to the train station and says, you're going to New York, you're going to Nyada, and I'm not going to get in the way of your dreams. Oof. Roblox death sound half speed. What is going on up here? I think my allergies are playing up. At the train station, everyone's there to see Rachel off. Then we have Rachel arriving in New York and the season finishes. If you think about it, Rachel finished high school at a bit of a mega slay. Like she was prom queen, show choir national champion, and she got into Nyada. Also her outfit at the end of this episode is ridiculously good. Rachel Berry style icon question mark? So that is the first three seasons of Glee or the first 66 episodes. We covered a lot of ground. I talked a lot of shit, but at the end of the slay, we made it. Let's forget that I forgot to put Roz on there. Forget about that. Can you stop asking about that? Let's quickly talk about some trends on the board. You can see here that Tina didn't really get much airtime at all. And it's not like I didn't put her stuff on the board. She did start to get more time in season three, but I think she gets more in season four and five. Adi was kind of just all over the place. Will started off as a mega shit and became less shit as the show went on, but this was just so menacing. Rachel has a similar kind of trend. You can see that it starts to get less negative as the show goes on. Sue actually has the most cards and I was quite surprised by that when I was writing my notes. Mercedes ones are all positive. My bestie did nothing wrong. Kurt's are kind of 50-50, which is interesting. I did think that Blaine would have more. Like he was in season three a lot, but it was mainly just singing. He didn't actually have that many plot points and a lot of his plot points were linked to Kurt. Brittany is another example of doing absolutely nothing wrong. Look at this. Sam didn't really do much besides be there and be nice the whole time. When I saw Finn's finished list, I did feel kind of bad. I was like, did I have nothing else positive to say? But then I went through and I was like, this is kind of accurate. I probably could have put a couple more nice ones in, but then I'd have to take some of these out. Santana does have a lot of entries and I am biased because I really love this character. Quinn's ones show how much of a complex character she is and Puck's ones 
Yeah. In part two, I'll do seasons four to six. I'll also talk about the Glee project and I might talk about that 3D movie that they did. I might even do an ALDC pyramid of all the characters. Part two will probably be out around middle or end of May, but I definitely do have other videos going up before that, so I will have some content out. Thank you all so much for watching this, and thank you all so much for waiting while I made this. It took such a long time. Even though I spent a really long time making the Pretty Little Liars one, I thought, okay, I've done this once, it's gonna be so much quicker the second time. No, but I'm actually really happy with how this looks. And once we have the second side of the board and you can flip it and see the difference between the first half of the show and the second half of the show, I think it's gonna be really cool. If you're not subscribed already, feel free to do so. Feel free to leave me a like and a comment. It does help me out a lot. I've decided that I'm going to try and get to 1 million subscribers before the end of the year, which is just wild to even say. It's giving dreams, goals, gold stars, Rachel Berry, Nyada. Feel free to follow me on Instagram and TikTok if you wanna keep up with what I'm doing. But yes, thank you all so much for watching and I'll talk to you all soon. Peace out, bye.